use that to benefit multiple different functional areas regardless of where they are. And uh, that is how I got into Six Sigma uh, when I was part of a manufacturing company. And uh, uh, since then we have been using it, it in, in my consulting practice uh, in inclusive consulting as well in various different clients in variety of different industries and various, various different geographical locations. I have worked in the US, in the Middle East as well as South Asia. I started my career in the US in public accounting and consulting. And I spent about uh, seven years and six, uh, six and a half, seven years over there. I was associated with Baker Tilly and Deloitte, one of the big four accounting firms. Then I moved to uh, Pakistan uh, and I was part of the biggest private sector conglomerate group over there uh, called the Engro Group. And uh, they had businesses in manufacturing, consumer goods and trading and rice manufacturing. And I will have served as a head of internal audit as uh, head of accounting and tax, as head of finance and CFO as well. And uh, then I moved to Dubai and uh, started uh, my own consulting practice as inclusive consulting. And we help clients implement a Six Sigma methodology and uh, implement uh, 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 in uh, business process improvement uh, initiatives and process efficiency initiatives as well to eliminate waste. And that is where Six Sigma comes into play, where we use this methodology to help our clients. So in today's session, what I will be doing is I will be going through this methodology. So I'll give you a brief overview of the Lean Six Sigma, its methodology, how it came into being, and what is the purpose of this methodology. Then the remainder part of the session will be focused on each of the different tools which are used in various phases of this uh, Six Sigma methodology. And uh, because it's a longer session, three hour session, we will have a general Q&A at the end of the session, the last 15 minutes. But what we will also do is to keep an engaging session, an interactive session, and to make sure that we do not wait for all the questions at the end after each unit, for example, uh, which involves a tool. So for example, unit number one is just an overview. We'll immediately move into unit number two after that, which is the project chart charter. That is the first tool that we have in the first phase of the Six Sigma. So after the end of that uh, unit, number two, I will give a pause and I will ask you if you have any specific questions related to the tool that we just discussed. So if you have any tool specific questions, you can ask over there. And once that is through then, or if you don't have any questions, we'll move on to the next uh, tool and uh, the next unit as well. So that is how we will structure the uh, session. Uh, and let's uh, move on to the next uh, stage then. So the first unit will be a, a overview of the Lean Six Sigma. It is basically a business management strategy. People get confused a lot. Of, is it a business management strategy? Is it a process management strategy? Is it a quality management strategy? It is actually a business management strategy. It helps you identify and improve the quality of your entire business process. So it was originally developed by Motorola in 1986, but it was actually pioneered and made a uh, popular by GE, General Electric. Uh, so they actually institutionalized, Motorola was using it in-house, GE started this in-house and then GE expanded it to make it more uh, globally recognized and uh, commercially available to rest of the organizations as well. Uh, so a lot of people think that this was initiated and introduced by uh, GE. Uh, this methodology was actually introduced and developed by Motorola and then it was pioneered by GE, GE later on. Uh, the, there are three main purposes of the Six Sigma methodology. It is to improve the quality of the product or the service that you are delivering to your customer. So it improves the overall quality. And the way it does that, it, 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 it identifies and removes errors and mistakes and wastages from it. So it makes sure that the process that you use or the method that you use to develop that product or service to your customer it is error-free and it is highly efficient. It is wastage-free. That's the first aspect of it. And then and the second aspect is to minimize variability. Whether you are providing a service or whether you are providing a product, you want to make sure that you provide consistent quality of service or product to your customer. So it this methodology ensures that consistency aspect of it. It wants to make sure that this uh, a good quality product or a good quality service is not a one-off thing or is, it is not a, a fluke, or it is not a, something that happens one or one off, uh, once in a while. It is something that happens every single time you deliver something to your customer. So that is the main purpose behind that, this methodology. So what is this methodology? It 
uh, it actually measures the product or service that you deliver in terms of the number of errors or mistakes in that product or process. And the way it does is it's called defects per million opportunities, DPMO. And in terms of Six Sigma, so if you say that you have reached Six Sigma level, that means that in 1 million products or 1 million times you delivered a particular service to a customer, the defects were in that was only 3.4. So that actually translates to 99.9997% accuracy. So that is what Six Sigma methodology is, uh, is uh, calculating the number of errors or number of defects, defects in a product or service. And they look at critical to quality factors in order to calculate this, uh, this effectiveness of your product or service. And those critical to quality factors are determined what is the most important aspect of your product or quality in terms in the eyes of your customer. So the customer is the most important point of reference whenever we talk about Six Sigma. Uh, the, I've given you at the bottom in the blue shaded area, the calculation for people who are interested in that. It is basically, it's the number of defects that actually occur in a product or service multiplied by a million and divided by the number of units or the number of uh, you have produced or the number of times you have provided that service and, and uh, multiplied by the number of opportunities uh, of errors or defects available when you uh, have that product. So for example, if you are manufacturing a plastic bot water bottle, so there are multiple different opportunities for our defects. So it could have a leakage. It could have a deforming a deformation in this shape. It could have a damaged uh, cap or a damaged seal. So there are at least at least four that we just counted about. So it would be looking at that it, it, for each number of product of uh, water bottles, there are at least four defects opportunities opportunities which are critical to the success of uh, in terms of the customer's point of view. So for each number of unit you produce, there are four opportunities available. If you have one million products uh, that you have produced in a period, so that is four million opportunities that were there. And then you see how many actual had actual defects occurred in the number of products that you produced. Similar calculation is done even if you're providing a service as well. So for example, there could be a multiple different ways a service could go wrong. The service could go wrong in terms of the timelines of delivery, in terms of the quality parameters, in terms of the completeness of the service that you provided. So in terms of, and in terms of the quality of the service that you provided. So again, there could be multiple different factors. Again, you look at it from the customer's point of view, what is the most important critical factors to quality or to acceptance of a good product or service in the eyes of the customer? And that is how you can calculate the number of opportunities for defects available. So just to give you a perspective over here, uh, a lot of times people think that why do we need Six Sigma? Why do we really need to go to 99.9997% accuracy? Why is 99% not good enough? So let me just give you a little bit of a perspective in multiple different industries. So if you look at a uh, coastal industry or a courier industry, uh, so if so, 99% effectiveness would actually mean a 3.8 sigma, sigma level, not six sigma level. So that would mean that if you have 2 million posts or uh, parcels uh, delivered in the world per hour, that would actually translate to 20,000 lost articles or uh, incorrectly delivered articles per hour if you are at 3.8 sigma level, which is 99%. If you actually reach six sigma level, which is 99.9997%, that extra 0.7%, 0 0.0003% uh, is giving you a translation in terms of the logistics of courier industry of seven articles lost per hour. So there's a comparison of 20,000 versus seven. That is how much of a difference that 3.4% uh, uh, per million can actually make. So from 3.99% to 99.9997%, it goes down from 20,000 to seven articles. Now, if you think about Diva or your water uh, authority, if it, you are at 99%, that actually means unsafe drinking water for almost 15 minutes each day. If you are at six sigma level, that translates into one 
minute unsafe water every seven months. There, first you had 15 minutes per day. Now you're talking about one minute every seven months. That is the huge difference it makes because it is talking about high volume industries. That is how, uh, that is where predominantly this uh, methodology was uh, used. And now if you have uh, the healthcare industry, if you are at 3.8 sigma level or 99% effectiveness, that would mean 5,000 incorrect surgical operations per week. If you are at six sigma level, that is only 1.7 incorrect op operations per week. So from 5,000 to only 1.7 or two, two operations uh, per week. That's the level of difference. Uh, if you're talking about airline industry, it would 99% uh, would mean two short or long landings or incorrect land, uh, landings daily at an airport like a Dubai airport or O'Hare International Airport in Chicago, which are more than 200 flights per day. So any airport with more than 200 flights per day, if they are operating at 99% effectiveness, that actually means two short or long landings per day. And if they're uh, operating at six sigma levels, th that means one short or long land landing. Sorry. Every five years. So that is the level of difference that we are talking about. Uh, so similarly, if uh, you're talking about uh, healthcare industry, again, in terms of uh, pharmacies uh, or doctors prescribing their uh, patients the uh, prescription for their uh, diagnosis, that would mean 2 million wrong drug prescriptions every year versus 680 per year if you're at Six Sigma level. Similarly, if you're talking about Hewlett Electric Authority, uh, or again, Diva, it would be something like seven hours of electricity breakdown every month versus one hour every 34 years. So this is the amount of difference it can make to your customer service in terms of your product or service quality to your customer when you implement something like Six Sigma. Now, the, the one thing to understand is that the journey from let's say 75% or 80% to 99% might still be a little bit easier comparatively compared to the journey from 99% to 99.9997%. And that is why a lot of companies that have reached that level of 99% decide to implement Six Sigma because without that rigor, without that discipline, without that strength of a methodology behind you, it becomes very difficult to reach to that high standard level. Uh, that does not mean that Six Sigma cannot be applied when companies are operating at below 99%. That do also does not mean that this Six Sigma is only for companies when they have reached 99%. Because of the strength of the methodology that it can take you from 99 to 99.9997%, that means that that same methodology can also be used to take you from 75 to 90% or 95 to 99% as well. So Six Sigma methodology's strength is that it has the power it has the capability to be that effective, but you can use that methodology to whatever level of effectiveness that you want to raise. So, and it is a long journey. It is, doesn't happen overnight. You cannot reach from 3.8 sigma level to six sigma level in a very short period of time. It takes a lot of time to reach to that level of perfection or excellence. Now, how does six sigma come into play in the organization structure? So every organization has vision or a mission statement. And based upon that vision or mission statement, a strategy is made on how to, uh, again, uh, according to that vision mission statement. And then a, a, a set of objectives and targets are made to achieve that strategy. And in order to achieve those projects, uh, those objectives, there are pro special projects or special initiatives that a company takes. And then there are existing processes, existing systems that are already in place in the company that work to help achieve those objectives and strategy. The vision mission statements is done and prepared usually by the senior level executives, which are board of directors and CEO and the president or a stakeholder level. Then the strategy is made by the senior executives, which are running the company, CEOs and the vice president level people. And the departmental objectives are done in line with the executives and the head of the departments. And with those head of the departments, in order to achieve those objectives, they come up with projects and processes. Now, this is where majority of the middle management works 
they are either part of a special project or they are part of, ex of conducting existing processes or a mix of both. So this is where Six Sigma comes into play. It looks at those and in any given organization, the new initiatives, the new projects are few. The existing processes, existing systems are high volume, more in number. So this is where Six Sigma comes in because like I mentioned in the previous slide, Six Sigma is most effective where there's a high volume of activity because that is where you have a higher chance of making mistakes or errors happening or defects happening or chances of inconsistencies. So this is where Six Sigma uh, works best and therefore it applies on processes. It can be applied to projects in certain specific cases as well. As you will see some of the tools, it, they are equally applicable in projects but they are most effective in a high volume activity area, which are most of mostly your processes. So another reason to understand why, why Six Sigma is focused on processes and high volume is that if you have got the right strategy, you've got most efficient processes, you're successful. That's a no brainer. Again, similarly, if you have the wrong strategy and you've got inefficient processes, you're gonna fail immediately. That's again a no brainer. The challenge happens in the other two quadrants. If you have the right strategy, but you have very inefficient processes, you're going to, you may have some success in the short term, but you can have a long term failure. So similarly, if you have a highly efficient processes, but you have the wrong strategy, again, you may have some success because of your efficient process in the short term, but again, it will be a long term failure. So where, where should we focus more in terms of the methodology to be able to fix so Six Sigma thought about this in this way that in term, if you have the wrong strategy, but you have the most efficient processes, how much effort would be needed to fix the strategy? Like we saw in the previous slide, in a strategy, the people that are involved are the CEOs and the senior executives only, very few people in number. So they can, they can be got, brought back together in the room, have a brainstorming session, use a few tools and realign the strategy. So that is easier to fix Versus if you have to fix all of the processes, if you've got the right strategy, but the reason why you're not able to achieve that strategy is because you've got very inefficient process. And those processes are being handled by many, many, many people and employees in the company. So the, a large volume of activity, a large number of people involved, and that's why it's going to take much longer and much more difficult to fix that aspect. So this is where Six Sigma methodology then focuses on because it's much more difficult to fix. Another re place, so another place where Six Sigma comes into place is that is uh, in uh, my, one of the previous sessions that I conducted on performance management, if you attended that, we talked about KPIs. So a lot of the companies have KPIs as a performance measurement system in their companies to track performance and the quality aspect. Now you can track that in terms of dashboards. You can manage them where the performance is acceptable as per your targets, in terms of your policies, procedures, and software and technology, but wherever your actual performance is not coming up to the mark, it's be below your expected levels or it's below your target, how do you improve that process and bring it back to the acceptable level? And that is where Six Sigma comes into place. Six Sigma is that methodology that gives you the tools to go towards that improvement journey. It helps you improve and comes up, come up with those solutions to improve that and not only just improve that as a one-off, come up with a sustainable improvement methodology. So that is where Six Sigma comes into play. So the, the, uh, the target of Six Sigma is that you want to prevent defects. So for example, if you've got this, this kind of a product or service category where you've got a upper limit and a lower limit, or you've got quality parameters that this is the acceptable range which my customer is going to be happy with. Anything below that or anything above that is not going to be acceptable to my, my customer. So it, it could be a product parameter in terms of temperatures, in terms of uh, flexibility, in terms of colors, in terms of quality of the product. It could be service as well, in terms of timelines, in terms of quality, in terms of experience of people, you can have upper and lower limits as well. So either way, those out, those, are called defects if they are outside those limits. So if they're outside those limits, the customer is not gonna be happy. So the, one of the objectives of Six Sigma is to make sure that these items are minimized. So you reached that 99.9997 level where the defects are only 3.4 per million. 
The second aspect of the uh, Six Sigma methodology is to centralize the entire process of your delivery of products and service so that majority of the time, 99.997% of the time, you are at the average level of the expected level of the customer's requirements. So that's where the biggest average lies. So in the right, right in the center. So if you're, if you have got a lot of uh, uh, products and services which are happening below the lower limit, and only few which are happening at the up, uh, at the central spectrum. What Six Sigma does is centralize the process so that most of your items would lie within the category ranges, within the lower and upper upper uh, ranges. So that's the second objective. The third objective is to make it more consistent as well. So it tries to centralize so more and more and more of your products and services start reaching the average level rather than below average or a higher level, but it's still within the limit. So even within the limit, the third level of efficiency what, the, what Six Sigma reaches towards is it's make it closer and more and more towards the average. So it reduces the spread, spread of the variability as well. So it reduces the inconsistencies. So first of all, the first objective is to make sure that nothing is outside the requirements of the customer. The third aspect is to make sure more and more our items are lying within the uh, acceptable limits. And the third objective is to make sure more the variability and the inconsistency is reduced to the minimum level, even within the uh, limit, within the upper and lower limitations. So that is the objective of Six Sigma. Now, uh, there is a myth that people think that Six Sigma was started by Motorola. It was pioneered by GE. It just belongs to manufacturing division about with manufacturing plants uh, or maybe to supply chain. It does not apply to service uh, functions or service industries. That is a myth. Six Sigma methodology and the tools can be applied to accounting, finance, IT, audit, logistics, healthcare service providers, IT service companies, uh, accounting service provider to a service company as well as to any service functions within a manufacturing company or a service company. HR, uh, procurement, uh, IT, uh, finance, uh, government relations department, any service department that you talk about, the Six Sigma tools can be applied. So what I will try to do and uh, when I whenever we talk about the tools, I will try to give some examples from the manufacturing industry and some examples from the service functions where Six Sigma tools can be used uh, and the way uh, and how they can be used. So you can get a broader idea and you can see how Six Sigma tools can actually be applied everywhere. They're not just limited to the manufacturing sections. Now, this is the methodology Six Sigma uses. It's called DMAC, D-M-A-I-C. These are the different five phases that the Six Sigma uses. Uh, one of the strengths of Six Sigma is that this methodology is very, very strongly driven by high quality data. So in every single phase, uh, there is a data collection, data authentication, data verification, and then decision based upon that data. So these, uh, these five phases are uh, defined. This is where you define the problem and understand the problem completely because Six Sigma methodology is that if you don't understand the problem correctly and completely, you will either not be able to resolve that problem or you will come up with a half solution which is not going to be resolving the entire problem as well. So we want to make sure that we, when we are investing our time, effort and resources, we fix the problem, problem properly and completely. So that's where the definition phase is very, very important. A lot of emphasis is placed over there in two ways. One, understand the problem and the nature of the problem. And the second, because it's all data driven, understand the data behind the problem to understand the quantity or the level of the problem as well, how big the problem is or how big the impact is. So in this defined phase, you understand what the problem is and you understand the magnitude of the problem as well. And there are specific tools that we use. So what I will try to do in this short span of time, I cannot go through all the tools of all the phases. So I'm trying to touch at least one or two tools in each of the phases so that you can get a complete idea and picture in the three hours. Uh, so in defined phase, we have certain tools. and the measure phase, you're gonna measure the current performance, which is as is, where do you stand right now? What is this situation currently? 
and you gather data and you gather a specific to uh, you use specific tools to measure what is the current problem looking like once you understand the problem and you see where you are at now then you can start the analyze phase where you understand the root causes of the problem you understand how big the opportunity is to be able to fix it and you can understand the analysis aspect of it and to see where to go so the measure phase is the as is and the analyze phase is where to go and then the improve phase will identify the solutions or the recommendations on how to get to that uh, level so the measure phase is your current status the as is the analyze analyze phase is your target or the to be status or the target environment target uh, area and the improve phase is how to get to that target or how to get to your uh, uh, target environment and then the control aspect is another very important aspect which a lot of people sometimes miss on is the is sustainability is that you need to have some review mechanism some reporting mechanism some control systems in place to make sure that the system improvement which you have brought about by using this methodology continues in forward and for many many years so a lot of times what happens is people make a one time improvement there's a lot of energy behind that a lot of focus behind that and it happens and then after a few months after maybe less than a year it goes back to the old ways and the system starts becoming degrading as well so this is where the control aspect becomes very important that you don't want to miss that a lot of times a lot of energy is put in people get tired towards the improved stage and they get very energetic towards the solution and they get uh, very uh, glam it's glamorous a lot of uh, focus is there from the company on the implementation of the solutions and then they forget about the control phase so as part of the implementation it is very important to have that controls built into that implementation as well so that you make sure that whatever improvements you are coming up with they continue in a sustainable fashion so what lean six sigma is a set of tools and what lean six sigma does is it provides a systematic structure to problem solving so if you want to describe six sigma in a one short phrase what it, it what i would say is it is a structured and systematic way to solve problems that is what six sigma is and what the six sigma has is a set of tools which you can use and that structured methodology that you can use with those tools to make sure that the problem solving methodology that you are using comes up with practical realistic and sustainable solutions that's what six sigma tools is all about and if you implement those properly what you get in return is a higher quality product or service which you can deliver to your customer more effectively and efficiently at lower cost so that improves your profitability as well so we have already covered this now in terms of challenges before we move on to how to implement six sigma and use the tools uh the biggest challenge that happens with six sigma is availability of authentic data because six sigma methodology is so focused on data driven decisions it at every stage it looks and it asks for authentic data so you need to make sure that you have data available you need to verify and authenticate that data to make sure that you are starting every time with the right process i have gone through a situation where one of the uh, client was uh, almost spent 4 months in completing a proceed uh, the uh, the project for six sigma improvement they identified the solutions they implemented the solutions and 3 months later when they captured the data they said there has been no improvement and when the diagnostic happened it turns out when they did the data in the defined stage at as when they were quantifying the problem that data to begin with was wrong data the source was wrong and the software was wrong the software was faulty so it gave them all the wrong data so at every stage you need to make sure that you authenticate and verify the data to make sure that you are starting with the right set of data and information uh, so a lot of companies do not have data available so if you are in a in a situation where there is lack of availability of data through automatic systems or the erp system then you need to make sure that you allow yourself extra time to capture the manual data 
and capture the very uh, uh, capture the manual data and verify and authenticate that manual data to make sure that you've got it correctly so that is the challenge that you need to allow yourself the additional time even if you've got erp systems available and system based data i would also recommend that as a best practice on a sample basis check the validity and authenticity of the data as well a lot of times we have encountered situations where a system based data was uh, generated from a report which was not uh, authenticated because the same report you generated later on with the same parameters different data came out so there was a system there was a data database corruption issue with the software so you want to make sure that uh, you don't just rely on a system based data because it came, it is coming from a system you want to make sure you verify you test it to authenticate it is the correct data as well because six sigma methodology is applied on the process it requires that you are uh, the team members that are working on the project have a good understanding of the business process and the steps in the process which are involved this is not a full blown six sigma so there are no complicated statistical tools in the lean six sigma there are simpler tools without the need of a software without the need of complex statistical calculations available also six sigma methodology like i mentioned it is a journey so it you cannot go from 99% to 99.9997% very quickly so six sigma is not a big one time improvement it is smaller chunks continuous improvement because remember it is uh, if especially you are a company who, which has already reached the level of 99% effectiveness you cannot have a big level of improvement anyway because you can have smaller increments of incre uh, improvement to get to that 99.997 if you are using six sigma where you are already at 45 50 or 60s or even at the low 70s then you can have a low hanging fruit you can have a bigger jump when when you initially launch six sigma initiatives or use six sigma methodolo methodologies for improvement you can have some bigger chance 10% 15% in the first go and then you start having smaller chunks of improvements towards going towards 95% plus uh, performance improvement so that is also one thing that needs to be there i mentioning this in terms of managing expectation so if you are a, a person who is responsible for implementing six sigma methodology in your company or your department or your function this is something that you need to make sure to that you know of so you can manage the expectations of your stakeholders that by doing this you not going to have a big improvement immediately you can have smaller pieces of improvement that will take you towards a higher quality product or service let's go to our first tool which is the in the define phase uh, of the demac methodology which is the first phase in the project charter it is a formal document a lot of time people start a project or they think they understand the problem or they know the problem and and they start the project halfway in the problem solving stage you realize that every team member of that project had a different understanding of what the problem was so this is why it is encouraged it is highly recommended that every single time you're going forward to solve a problem make sure that you have a formal document which defines that problem what is the actual problem what is the purpose of setting up this team or going into the journey of solving this problem why are you going towards solving this problem what is the magnitude what is the impact what is the benefit of solving this problem so you need to have a very formal clearly documented uh, project charter where every single team member every single stakeholder is completely aligned and clear on what is the journey that go, uh, that they are taking forward the many purposes of this project charter it can serve as an uh, as an authority uh, document as well it as an approval document that auth formally authorizes the project because you can have project sponsors you can have projects approving authority you can have the steering committee you can have a lot of these information in, available in the project charter and we'll share with us a sample, sample template as well uh, in the these slides so it serves as a formal authoritative uh, approval for the starting of this project so your stakeholders then sign off that yes this is the problem that we want to solve we all agree on this problem it serves as the primary document for the entire project so it will have the high level benefits of the project so every single time there is a question why are we spending time on this project why are we wasting time on the and uh, resources on this project so a lot of times people are nominated from cross different functions into a cross functional team and then your boss 
says, why are you giving this so much time? This is a waste of time. This document can show that this is the benefit of solving this problem. This is the financial impact on this company or non-financial impacts on the company. And that is the document that you can show that the, we are spending these times and resources on this project because of these benefits. Is this a priority of the company or not? So this can realign the priorities for the company as well, for the project and for the problem solving initiatives. So, and thirdly, it provides a focus point as a, as a point of reference for everybody who's working in the team on, the, on that special project to improve for the improvement project as well. So it realigns every time there is a discussion or a brainstorming session and there's a, there's a feeling that some members are going on a tangent or we, are, we seem to be losing track this document can be brought up again and again and say, no, this is the problem. This is the project charter. This is what is in the scope. This is what is out of our scope. So let's get realign ourselves. So, so what it has is it has the project problem statement. So you clearly define the state, the problem and the magnitude of the problem as well. And the data that supports that problem statement. Then you have the objective. Where, what do you want to achieve? How much of the problem do you want to resolve? Do you want to resolve 80% of it? Do you want to resolve 95%? Where do you want to reach? What is your goal and target? And then what are the required resources that are available to you or to the team to be able to solve this problem? As part of those resources, you will have some financial resources. You will have some uh, human resources. So what is the project team? How many members? From where? Who, what are the names of the, those people? How much time would they be allowed to spend on this project? So uh, what you can include in the project charter is the project authorization. So the approving authority, the project manager, who is the project lead, the key stakeholders who will be monitoring the prog uh, progress in this project. What are the project goals, the priorities, and the most importantly, the scope statement as well. So this is something very highly recommended that a lot of times just defining the problem statement in a sentence or a verbal uh, text is not sufficient to clarify the scope or size of the project. So what we recommend is having a rectangular in scope, out scope box. And inside the box, rectangular box, you put in, this is the scope. So a scope could be, okay, fine. We've got, let's say we've got, a, a, we are doing an improvement projects in our delivery, logistics delivery time to our customers for the product. Now you may have delivery in throughout the UAE, but you can say that, okay, first priority is to improve the deliveries in UAE, uh, in Dubai. So you can say, okay, we've got the business in the entire UAE, but for the purpose of our project or the, or the improvement initiative that we are doing, we are focusing in scope is Dubai, rest of the Emirates are out of scope. Or you can say within Dubai, we are focusing on new Dubai area, this is in scope, rest of the areas are out of scope. So similarly, if you're providing a service to a different, to a, a service to, let's say, uh, provide these services to HR, we provide this to finance, we provide this to procurement, we provide this to multiple different functions. You can say, okay, our focus is going to be, let's say, finance and HR only. So you can say finance and HR is in scope, the rest of the functions, rest of our customers are out of scope. So if we, either way, either it's because of your look at geographical location, the type of product, the type of services, the type of customers, demographics of the customer, you can say within certain age bracket, whatever it is, define, use this in scope, out of out scope box to further clearly define the scope of the project. So anytime there is a future discussion in terms of improvement, in terms of solutions, in, in terms of uh, root cause of the problem, if you find, and you can, this can be a reference document that you, no, 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 we cannot discuss this because this is out of scope. We are, we are discussing something and wasting time on something which is out of the scope of this project. Let's stay focused, let's come back to what is in the scope of the project. So this is the utility of the project charter document. This is a sample, just again, just a sample of, just to show you what are the different kinds of categories or pieces of information that you can put in a project charter. You can have administrative information in terms of project name, you can give a slogan as well for the project, the date of the start of the project, the business unit uh, which is involved in this project, uh, who's the project champion? What are the timelines? Who's the process owner that you're impacted? So for example, if you are, um, let's say you are trying to improve the PR purchase requisition to purchase order cycle time. 
Now, the, who is the process owner? The process owner could be procurement department. The business unit, you were saying, okay, I am doing most of the purchases for, let's say, the uh, manufacturing uh, department. So the project, the business unit that I'm targeting is the manufacturing division. I do some uh, procurement for the service division or for sales department, for marketing department, but the biggest chunk is to, uh, to manufacturing division or they are the most critical customer who have the biggest complaints uh, for this uh, uh, delivery. So let me target them first. So you can define that business unit over there. You can define, define who's the process owner. Uh, then you can have the project definition information, which is the problem statement, the objectives, and the problem metrics. How will you measure the performance of the problem? How good are you? Are? What is the metric? What is the KPI that you are using to measure this? Uh, again, because remember, in the measure phase, we're going to be measuring the current performance. So you need to know how, to, will, how will you be measuring the current performance. You can have resource requirements as a team members and who's the project uh, leader or the team leader. You can have financial information as what are the revenue or cost or any opportunity cost related benefits which will happen if you solve this problem. So this is the benefit card. So this is where the justification can come in that we are spending our time and resources in solving this problem because it has these benefits. Again, also, it can serve the purpose of the other way around as well. You may get to this stage and when you are going through this benefit card, you may find out that the benefits are not that big and the resources required or the time required to solve this problem is going to be very costly. So at this defined stage, you can have the opportunity to discard this project and say, no, we cannot proceed right now because the benefits do not outweigh the cost it was. So either we need to do it this differently or we cannot do this project right now. So rather than finding this out after at, you, at the improved stage or the analyzed stage or the, even at the last end of the control stage that the benefits did not even happen. You ended up spending so many months and so many resources of the company and the benefits were not that big at all. So you want to hash that out at the defined stage so that without having to spend a lot of time and resources, you can decide whether this is a go project or a no go project. So this is another advantage of having a, a project charter. So now we, we, before we move on to the next uh, unit, I'm going to take a break over here and ask if you have any specific questions relating to Six Sigma methodology, which is DMAC methodology, and the tool, the first tool that we talked about, which is the project charter. So you can use your, uh, uh, if you, uh, you can use your uh, raise hand feature at the bottom, uh, you will have uh, an option to raise your hand in the, and then we can see uh, uh, who has raised hand. We can call out your name and then you can unmute yourself and speak out. So we see uh, Atiba has raised her hand. So yes, please unmute yourself and ask uh, what question you have. Uh, I was asking, can you give us an example of the problem metrics, like how to measure that problem? What, what, what sort of measurement tool could be used here as a part of problem metrics? Measurement? So before I give this answer, can I ask you, give me, can you give me an example of the kind of problem that you may be solving? Um, like, for example, if I'm working in an NGO and there is a problem of fundraising, uh, what would be my problem metrics? How would I measure that uh, fundraising? So, so, uh, so can you define the problem a little bit more? So what is the problem with the fundraising? Is it that you're not able to reach the fundraising target? Generate, yes. To okay, generate perfect. the funds that are, that are like perfect, required. Perfect. perfect. So your problem statement is going to be that inability to generate the required funds as per target, right? So that could be your problem statement. Now, the problem metrics then becomes very easy because the problem metrics is the number, the percentage of funds generated as a percentage of your target. So your total funds generated divided by your total target. So that becomes your problem metric. So that is something that you can measure in your measure phase as well, that this is what the target is, and this is what we achieve currently. Or alternatively, you can have historical data as well. That historically, if you look at our past three year or five year history, every year we set up a target and we are able to generate, let's say 80% of our target. Why is it that we're not able to reach that last 20%? So that could be a problem metric as well. So again, it could be both ways. It could be historical data or the current performance level. And if, you, if your target is a problem statement is related to the, uh, the amount of funds raised versus target, then that becomes your metric is the percentage of funds raised as a percentage of your target. 
I hope that answers your question. Are there any other questions that we have? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else uh, with project charter questions? Okay, Aziz, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, we cannot hear you yet. Have you uh, connected your audio? Uh, sorry, Aziz, we cannot hear you. Is there anybody else uh, who has a question? All right, so let's move on to our next uh, tool, which is the SIPOC diagram. So this is a tool that you can use in your measure phase. So the reason for measuring this is, as we mentioned earlier, the Six Sigma is applied to your processes. And one of the information that you need to have to be able to continue with that analysis is, so for example, uh, we'll take Atiba's example, that there is a fundraising problem statement uh, related to the ability to reach the target of the funds. So that means that there is a process that they use to raise the funds. So there's a fundraising process. So you need to understand and know the fundraising process. So what you do is there are a couple of tools that you can use to measure that process and see where is the problem in that process and what, what is the quantification of the problem. So this is where we'll start evaluating some data and start capturing how big the problem is or where the problem is lying over here and how big it is. So for example, you can use the SIPOC mapping, you can use value stream mapping, and you can use as a spaghetti diagram. So these are some of the three tools that you can use and we'll just give you a quick overview of these as well. So in SIPOC mapping, basically SIPOC stands for suppliers, S stands for suppliers, inputs, process, outputs, and customer. Some people use, uh, don't say it's SIPOC, they say it's COPIS, they start with the customer first. Either way is fine, as long as you have captured all five input, all five uh, categories. So whether you say COPIS or SIPOC doesn't matter, whichever way you want to start, that's fine. Uh, so the, what that means is that any given process, you will have some suppliers that will provide you some raw material, or if it is a, is a process, some data or some information. That, that those suppliers, whatever they give you, whether they give you raw material, whether they give you data, whether they give you a request or a form, that becomes your inputs. So what are the inputs that you receive and who are the suppliers? So first of all, you list down who are your suppliers. That could be outside suppliers. That could be your internal functions as well. So for example, if you are, if you are the fundraising process, then you can say, okay, to start the fundraising, I have a marketing company or I have another department or sales department that is providing a database of potential donors or the historical list of last year's donors. So that sales department becomes your supplier and the list of last year's donors or potential donors becomes your inputs. So you need to identify who your suppliers are in this specific process. You need to define what the inputs they give you. This, and then what, is, what do you do with those inputs? What is the process that you follow? Do you do cold calls? Do you ask for references? Uh, do you do some checking? There are some reference checking or some validation of those donor information. How do you proceed forward? What are the different steps you do? What are the different processes you use in your in the in, in the process that is you being targeted for as a process uh, as an improvement initiative in this project? So you list down all the steps and the sequence of those steps in the process side. If you follow that process, what is it out? What is the output that it produces as an outcome of those process? So for you, it would be a pledge that you will be receiving in terms of fundraising. And then who would be your customers? That once you have raised those funds, where will they be utilized? Are, are, is it in a children education, a schools? Is it in building a hospital? Is it a clinic? Is it a, is it a healthcare uh, facility in terms of rehab center? What, who are the customers? So this, when you have this charted out in front of you, you can get a complete end-to-end -end view. Who are my suppliers? What are they providing to me? 
what do i do with those what they provide to me what do i produce and for whom do i produce it so whether it is a product or a service it can be applied applied equally so we just gave an example of a service where you can use it for fundraising purposes similarly if you use a manufacturing example if you are producing let's say let's say if you are preparing uh, if you are manufacturing a plastic water bottle so you will have suppliers of uh, plastic you will have suppliers of cap you will have suppliers of uh, uh, labels and you can have suppliers of printing uh, in, in the uh, and and uh, providing you the mold of the shape of the bottle so you can have you can list down all of your suppliers and what do they provide you they provide you plastic they provide you printed labels they provide you the mold for the shape of the bottle they provide you caps they provide you the seals and you may they may even provide you a, a stamp on, of the uh, expiry date and uh, the manufacturing date so you list down all of your manufacturers then you have your inputs what they have provided you you've got that as well and then what do you do you've got the entire manufacturing process so which process you do what what is the process that you do with the plastic what is the process that you do with the labels what is the process that you do with the caps what is the process that you follow you lay that, lay that whole structure down and then what is the output the output is the finished plastic bottle and who are the customers if it's a water bottle it could be your uh, customers who who are drinking water if it's a uh, or your customers could be your uh, wholesale market or your hypermarkets like uh, carrefour or lulu so then you can define your customers accordingly as well so once you have that view then you can understand the second tool that you can use which is the value so this is the diagram of cypoc that you can chart how do you can do it either in excel or chart and word, word format as well you can start with suppliers input requirements and your process you've got output and your customers at the end so another aspect that you can use is a value stream mapping once you have those process what that value stream mapping does is that it for each step of the process you ask yourself three questions is this process when this person does this process does this process does this activity adds any value to the previous level so a lot of times what we find is that in finance function for example and even in procurement functions there are reviews and approvers there is first signatory and there is second signatory there is first approval and second approval every single time you have that process you need to ask yourself this question is this second approving authority or is this second signatory or is this second reviewer adding real value to the work that has been done by the first signatory or the first reviewer so if yes then you say value adding if no then you move on to the next question is there any business value adding so for example is there any strategic level value addition so there is no incremental value add to this process but is there a business level or strategic level value addition to to this additional step if yes you write bba it's a business value adding if no if these two questions are no then you write this is a non value adding step you can eliminate that step so that will save you time and cost and potential errors in that uh, in that work as well so that way you can eliminate these uh, inefficiencies so if you can identify what steps of the process are value adding so for example if you have got a step of where somebody is putting the plastic bottle in a crate arranging them properly and another person is putting the crate in the in the carton so you ask yourself the question is the person putting or or somebody and then there is a third person who is checking to make sure that the crate is the carton is full with the crate and every single spot is filled and then there is a quality control person after that so you ask as yourself is the person putting the per, crate into the carton adding any value to the process yes he is changing the packaging okay fine is the person who is checking whether or if all the entire crate is filled is adding any value or not maybe not because that step can be performed by the person who is putting the crate into the carton before he puts the crate into the carton he can check whether all bottles are filled in the crate or not or are there any spots empty so that's a non value adding step you can eliminate that process you can add that activity or a checkpoint with the person who is putting the bottles in the carton so that's how you can start to eliminate some wastage activity or waste wasteful uh, uh, steps in the process and start saving times and cost
So in a value stream mapping, what you can do is once you have constructed a SIPOC, that process portion, you take that column out and in the process portion, you can lay it out in this way that you've got the start of the process and you can take it to different steps and all the way to different people. In the columns, you can have different people or different departments. And then you can say, okay, how does the process end? And then at each step of the process, you can mark it VA or BBA or NVA. So VA would be value adding, BBA would be business value adding, and NVA would be non-value adding. So in everything that is non-value adding, you can just start to eliminate. So now we'll take a break over here as well, that in terms of your SIPOC analysis and in terms of your value stream mapping, are there any specific questions on those two tools? Any questions? Emma, do you have got a question? <clears throat> Ah, okay. All right. Okay. We will move on to, ah, okay. Sai, uh, Sai Pavan, you've got raised uh, your hand. Uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Yes, sir. The question which I have is, uh, what is the basic difference that we see between a value addition and a business value addition? How do we define that? Very how, good or question. how do we identify that? Good question. So a value addition is a direct value addition onto the previous process step. So a value addition means that this person has added value to the previous step that was performed. So a typical example of a, is of a different activity being conducted. So one is a preparer. The second person is a reviewer. That is a value added activity because first person was preparing a document. The other person reviewed to check everything was done properly. So that is still a value adding. Now, after the review, you put an approver as well, right? So that is the, that, so that approver has not done anything at all, has just checked that it has been prepared by somebody and has been reviewed by somebody. So that is not an value adding activity on the previous step. So that is, and, but then it is something that is necessary for the business because you need to make sure that that approving authority has the different, is a different person because they have different limits. Not everybody has an approving authority in the company. So you may have a preparer, you may have a reviewer, but then it needs to be approved by somebody who has the authority to approve. So that the approving activity is not a value adding activity because it does not added anything to the previous steps but it is a business value adding activity because you need a delegation of authority. You need somebody with authority to be able to approve this document. Now, if you have a second approving authority, that again begs the question, there's definitely no value addition in the previous step of the process. Is it really business value adding or is it becoming non-value adding? Most of the times what we have found out, especially when I'm doing consulting engagements and I'm arguing with people, especially audit and finance department people, they love to add approving authorities. First signatory, second signatory, first approval, second approval. And a lot of times when you start digging deeper, you find out that every single time you go to the second approval or second signatory and you ask them, what is it that you do? They invariably would answer you immediately and say, we just look at the first signatory assigned. There's absolutely zero value addition, absolutely zero business value addition. So that is the difference between value adding and business value adding. Value adding is immediately adding value to the previous step by doing something different to it or adding something to it or removing something from it or changing something to it. So that is a value adding activity. And if it's not add, changing it or adding any, or removing anything to it and it's just a review or approving a side of it then or a checking side of it, that's a business value adding question that you can ask. I hope Hi, that answers your uh, question. Sai, any other question? Yes. Uh, oh, Sai has the question. So Sai has already raised and asked the question. Okay. Yes, he has already asked. Uh, understood, Anyone sir, else? I got the point. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or we can move on? All right. So as is a spaghetti diagram, this is another way to, uh, for the same process uh, analysis, you can do that that it is an adaptation of the flow chart. It's a visual representation of the steps to complete a process. 
there are two pedigree diagrams which are uh, generally needed. Like I mentioned, you need to understand the as is, how are you doing it currently? And then where do you want to get to? So the, one of the advantages of this is that it can identify inefficiencies in the process steps in terms of wastages of time and people uh, movement. So what you do is, in order to draw the spaghetti diagram, you first need to draw on a piece of paper the floor plan or where each of the departments or each of the people who are involved in the process are situated and how they are situated. Then identify each person or object or department that is involved and place them in the chart according to the, their actual location. Then draw a line replic replicating actual flow of the steps. So where does it start? So you draw the first full stop over there and then it goes to the second person, second department, you draw the line all the way to the second department and then to the third step, the fourth step and the fifth step and you start seeing different kinds of lines. And then you continue to draw the lines and do not have any break until you reach to the end. So it doesn't matter how many times it is crossing over to each line, how many times it's bisecting or cutting off, doesn't matter, do it because it is designed to do this dramatically. So even if he's doing it th this way, do not worry about it. So you start with the different different departments. You have departments, you've got user departments for a for purchase acquisition. You've got control, financial controllers, you've got purchasing department, you've got the buyers and you've got the receiving doc. So you can have first step, second step, third step, all three steps are happening within the user department. And then it goes to the financial control controller maybe to check the budget. Then it goes to the purchasing supervisor. Then it goes to the buyer. It comes back to the purchasing supervisor. Then it, it, the material goes to the receiving doc, comes back to the purchasing supervisor, comes back to another, per, another, another person in the purchasing department. And then it goes back finally to back to the user department. So you can this way you can highlight and see that there are three steps that are happening within the department itself. Can we cut? And then we can identify which of these three steps are value adding business value adding or non-value adding. Similarly, we see that then it comes back to financial consumer, it goes back to buyers, comes that goes through purchasing and then goes to buy and then comes back to purchasing. Can we make this one sequential step that goes here, goes to buyers, doesn't need to come back to purchasing, can go back to the receiving dock. Can we do this? So again, it, this gives you, this starts giving you opportunities where you can further streamline the process by eliminating these inefficiencies that same departments, multiple steps. Again, Going out of the department, coming back in the department. Going out of the department, coming back in the department. Can we eliminate this and make it going this way, this way, this way, and then go back? Or ideally, going from department to controller, purchasing, buyer, receiving dot, directly to, directly to the user department, end of the process. Right. So this is how, and the purpose is to dramatize. It is intentionally designed to create that drama and dramatize the complication in the process. So do not worry about the crisscrossing of the lines, crisscrossing of the departments, multiple departments having points in the same, uh, multiple points in the same department. Do not worry about that. That is specifically designed for that purpose. It is intended to do so. And that is that would expose the inefficiencies in the process and the layouts as well. Similarly, also what you can see is you can identify the floors as well. This department is on the first floor, this department is the third floor, this department is back in the first floor. So you can see, okay, my layout is not very efficient either. First, the document goes in the first floor, then goes to the third floor, then it comes back to the first floor, then goes back to the outside world, then comes back to the, uh, the ground floor. So can we change the process? Can we change the department's layout? Can we make this department on the first floor as well and move this maybe to the second floor? Or can we have the buyer or the purchasing supervisor close to the receiving dock in the same floor? If a lot of times movement is happening over here, between these people. So we see who are the people who are touching points. So purchasing department is touching with the finance and with the department and with the receiving doc. Can we have them centrally located where it's easier for them to access? So these are the kind of questions you can ask in terms of the physical movements of the documents or the items. Make sure, so it, it can emphasize the unnecessary travel distance between different parties involved. Uh, make sure it is a continuous flow of line. You do not, just like we say in the school, you do not uh, lift your pencil until unless you reach the end of the process. And then you monitor the movement of the personnel as well during this process line. So this can this pictorial format 
usually helps to visualize the complication in the process because when you write it down in text format in the SIPOC analysis, or even if you identify in the process flow diagram, it may not clearly identify to an untrained person the actual inefficiency. So for example, me as a consultant, I have been doing this business process uh, efficiencies projects a lot of time. So I have been now trained and my eye, my eye is now trained to spot these inefficiencies without having to visually see it in front of me as well. Within, within the text as well, I can make a visual mind, uh, uh, in my mind, I can make a flow diagram and identify the inefficiencies. But to an untrained person in your team, it may not be easily possible for them to identify those inefficiencies or complications just through the verbal text format in the CIPOC analysis. So this, uh, this visual representation of that process and dramatizing and, uh, and exponentially highlighting those complications can help even the inexperienced people quickly identifying the complications of the process. Secondly, it can sometimes help you convince your stakeholders about the complexity and the process and the elimination that you need to do in terms of the inefficiencies. So sometimes even uh, uh, employees or consultants use this visual representations to convince the clients or convince your stakeholder. It helps identify the inefficiencies in the work play, layout, like we said, different floors, different uh, distance, different uh, uh, one corner to the other corner, different floors, different buildings. Sometimes you have functions in different buildings as well, different locations too. So you can uh, re rethink that design as well. It is uh, it gives you the opportunities for less handling. So for example, we saw purchasing department was handling too many times, different interactions. So can we streamline that process? Opportunity for better workforce communications rather than one department having to communicate with multiple different sources. Can we have a streamlined, throw, uh, streamlined flow? Resource allocations, where do you need more resources and time? Which process requires more time? opportunities for safety improvements as well. The less movements, less chances for errors and safety incidents. Uh, the, it can highlight the major intersection points where the lines are crossing. The more number of intersections means more opportunities for you to improve the process. You may not be able to eliminate all intersections, but every single intersection presents an opportunity for you to div, dig deeper, dive into the process and see if you can streamline this further. Any questions on uh, our spaghetti diagram? So the word spaghetti, because it's crisscrossing different kinds of uh, lines, multiple touch points, multiple crosses. Any questions on spaghetti diagram and how this can be used? Specifically, uh, spaghetti diagram and as uh, the value stream mapping is looking at your business processes. So the P in the CIPOC or COPIS. So when you have identified your suppliers and inputs and you're looking at the process that you are following to be able to generate the output that is required for your customer, now we are taking that process piece out and we are analyzing that process piece and measuring that process piece to see how we can improve this process so that our output of the customer gets improved because that is where the bulk of your control lies in the, is in the process that you follow. Any questions on uh, the process mapping tools that we have done so far? Again, you can raise your hand and ask the questions. Hello, I am Shamin. Yes. I am a system manager SAP support. I have a question because I am very much involved in process improving uh, projects. So what I have observed that people uh, avoid to eliminate any process in the name of SOPs. They say it is SOPs, they, uh, they bring KPIs, they bring transparency. Just as you said that they love, especially finance people love to add approver or um, reviewer levels in their processes. So I have observed whenever I suggest them that uh, you have to eliminate these uh, process or levels because it's just uh, switching out your process. So they were uh, resistant and they avoid to uh, eliminate those things. So uh, being a project manager, how we can tackle this thing, although we can uh, show them in a flow diagram or process flow in a visual diagram, but they never convinced, they convinced me what they are right. saying. One, in, one, in the, wonderful SOPs. question. So let, let me share a little story. Uh, and it's a funny story. So I can benefit the rest of the people as well. 
and i always tell this in my training uh, sessions as well for six sigma it's so wonderful uh, little anecdote to specifically about sops and how to change people's perception about the sop so uh, uh, there was a room and in the center of the room there is a ladder on top of the ladder you've got a bunch of bananas so what you do is you put five monkeys in that room what do you think the monkeys are going to do of course they're all going to run towards the bananas so as soon as the monkeys start climbing the ladder and you they start going towards the bananas the entire room gets showered with cold water so all of the monkeys get scared they come back down in the corner so if, so the, again they so the water stops so they wait for a couple of minutes again they go start they start to go towards the ladder to climb the ladder to get to the bananas on the top as soon as they start climbing the ladder the cold water comes back again at them at them and they again retreat back to the corner and stay there so they tried a couple of times maybe one or two or three times maybe but then they realize that every single time they try to go towards the ladder the cold water comes so they just sit quietly so what you do is you remove one of the old monkeys and you put a new monkey in the room so what do you think the new monkey is going to do the first thing he does is he starts running towards the ladder and what do you think the rest of the four monkeys do they grab a hold of him and they beat him up and the monkey is thoroughly confused why are they beating me up so he is confused twice first of all he sees that there are monkeys in the, my fellow monkeys in the room there is a bunch of bananas on the ladder and nobody is going towards the bananas so let me go towards it the second thing is confused is when i try to go towards the bananas they start beating me up so he sits quietly he looks around and then he tries to go towards the bananas again and then again the rest of the four monkeys grab a hold of him they drag him and they start beating him up so he try he gets beaten a couple of times and he says okay fine forget the bananas i'm just, i'm just going to stay here so again you remove another one of those four old monkeys and you put another new monkey in same story the new monkey is going to go towards the bananas running towards the ladder and now the three old monkeys including the one newer monkey all four of them are going to grab this new monkey in and it's not going to beat him, beat him up now the first old first new monkey that came in he is beating this new monkey in as well without knowing why is he beating him right so as you gradually and slowly you start removing all of the old monkeys and every and you keep putting in new monkeys in the room so that eventually you have five new monkeys in the room who have never been showered with the cold water but every single time a new monkey was put in and they, that monkey was going towards the bananas they all will grab a hold of him and start beating him up why so if you ask any of those monkeys they have absolutely no clue why they're beating each other up they have absolutely no clue why they cannot reach towards the bananas but they just don't so this is the most typical answers you get from the people who say that we are doing this because it's in the sop so my question to them is always why are you doing it so they said it's in the sop so my next question is why is it in the sop what is the purpose what is the rationale of the sop itself when we whenever we are doing a process improvement initiative nobody says that with the process improvement you cannot change the process that is the whole purpose which means you can change the sop the sop is not a bible that's not a sacred document sop can be changed so i can question the sop so my solution to that is that all so don't just listen to the question the uh, the argument that it's in the sop why is it in the sop 99% of the time when you ask this question why is it in the sop the typical answer you receive is this is how we have always done it's always been done this way that's why it's in the sop that is not a valid argument so like the old monkeys the old employees have gone they are the ones who made this sop the new employees have come in they have absolutely no idea why this sop exists they are just following the sop because the old people told them that this is how it is done this is how it's always been done so the initial person who was involved in writing the sop maybe they knew why this was there but after so many years so many people have changed processes have changed technology have changed scenarios have changed market has changed customer requirements have changed maybe the old sop is no longer valid anymore so it needs to be changed so my solution to that is that 
just because something is in the SOP or just because it has always been done this way doesn't make it right. So as a project manager, question and ask the question why. One of the tools that we have in Six Sigma is five whys. You ask the question why, why, why at least five times till you get to the root cause. Okay, this is why it is being done. Now, can I do it differently? Can I do it better? If I understand the reason why the SOP is there, then I can maybe come up with a better solution as well. And when I, when I address that solution or the reason of that SOP, then people are much more open to change that SOP. One. Number two, and the last point on this comment is, a lot of times people, the people who are more afraid to change anything as the SOP are the people who have no idea why the SOP exists. So if you ask the people who are saying, no, we cannot change the SOP, ask them why. What's the rationale behind this process? What's the rationale behind this step? Why is it in the SOP? They would have absolutely no clue. So if you cannot, if they cannot convince you, then they have to change it. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, Muhammad Atnan has got his uh, hand raised. Please uh, ask your question. Uh, so first of all, uh, I would like to say that uh, the topic that uh, you are uh, discussing is exceptional. Uh, you are going uh, very good. And the uh, question uh, I would like to ask from you, uh, can we compare uh, quality uh, seven tools uh, as uh, Sorry, I, I can be, I can could not hear you completely. Can you please speak a little bit louder? Hello. Yes. Are you hear me, sir? Yes. Uh, sir, the, the, the question is, uh, can we, uh, can we compare uh, seven QC tool to Lean Six Sigma tools? How we can compare uh, these tools uh, with Lean Six Sigma? I'm not tools. familiar with the seven uh, something tools that you said. But again, uh, there are many uh, to, uh, quality management protocols and methodology. Available. There's TQM, there's ISO, there's many other, uh, there is Kaizen, there is Lean, uh, there's Six Sigma. So there, these are all different kinds of methodologies, all with a different set of tools. Now, I don't think there is a comparison between one methodology to another methodology. You need to understand the premise or the perspective of the methodology and what is the basic objective of that each methodology? So, for example, the Kaizen methodology is about eliminating repetitive work or making, pro uh, making the process streamlined in an uh, uh, assembly line way or starting with a zero based budgeting. Uh, the lean methodology is about effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, so Six Sigma took some concept from Kaizen, some concept from Lean and made it a Lean Six Sigma, where the, if the entire objective of this methodology is to make your products consistent to your customer, to make them better quality and to make them at better cost. So these are the three objectives of Six Sigma methodology. So what you need to what you need to do is there is no real comparison between one methodology to another methodology or one tool to another tool. What you need to do is understand the objectives of the methodology and understand your requirements. And whichever methodology meets best meets your requirement, you use that methodology. Similarly, I go even to this extent, extent that there is no hard and fast rule that you cannot use a good tool from Kaizen when you're doing a Six Sigma project, there is no limitation. If you, and similarly vice versa as well, if you find, let's say uh, the CIPOC methodology, a good way to analyze your processes and understand your customer to cycle, uh, supplier cycle, use it. The third thing that I say is that a lot of times, sometimes people's mind work in different ways and in some, in some companies where the Six Sigma methodology is not widely accepted or that initiative has not been launched. Sometimes people become a little bit cautious or not very willing and open-minded to talk about a methodology and your solution via methodology. So I say for that situation, don't even mention it's a Six Sigma methodology. Don't even mention it's a Six Sigma tool. Just show us IPOC analysis as a way to understand the journey from your customer to suppliers. Who can argue with that? So similarly, if you don't have to mention that you're using a Six Sigma as a spaghetti diagram tool to understand the complexities of the business process. If you, you are in a situation where people are not very open to discussing different methodologies or Six Sigma, or some people have some uh, 
negative connotations or mindset already blocked about Six Sigma or a particular methodology, don't even use the word. Just show them the diagram and say, I use this to show and identify the complexities and the problems in the process. So, no need for any comparison for different tools. Use the tool that best fits your requirements. Any other questions? All right. So let's move on to our next tool, which is a Pareto chart. Uh, is somebody raising a hand? No, we are okay. Okay. So the next one is the Pareto chart. So we have covered the define phase. We have covered the measure phase. So in the measure phase, we, phase we had the uh, in the defined phase we had the project charter document tool. In the measure phase, we had the SIPOC diagram, the uh, the value uh, value stream mapping where we had the value addition, business value addition, and and non value adding process identified. And we had the error, uh, measure phase. Now you move on to the analyze phase. So the first tool that we talk about in the, the analyze phase is the Pareto charts. So basically, this is a uh, consultant by Alfredo Pareto. So he's, this is named after it. And what he designed this Pareto chart was to analyze. So now we're moving to the analyze phase. We analyze the causes of the problem and where we should focus on energies, is, energies for the best return on our investment in the resources. So it, it identifies the potential causes and it investigates and analyzes these causes. So for the analysis phase, we have Pareto chart. The second tool we have is fishbone diagram. The third tool is failure mode and effect analysis. But uh, for, for the time being, for this purpose of the session, we will only do Pareto charts and fishbone diagram. So in terms in the, uh, in the Pareto chart, it basically boils down to the fact that 20% of the causes are causing you 80% of the problem. Or by solving 20% of the issues, you can actually get 80% of the results. Or you can put it in this way that 20% of your effort can give you 80% of your return on investment. So, or 80% of the problem solving. So this is, the eight, this is also called the 80-20 principle. So 80% of the problems are actually can be solved by just focusing on the 20% of the root causes and fixing them. So this is what the Pareto chart and Pareto principle is. So this technique can help you prioritize your time, especially in a situation where you've spent a lot of time and you have got very limited time and resources in order to be able to fix the situation, or you're in a situation where you are, your actual current performance is very, so you've measured the current performance at the measure phase and the current performance is very low and you want a big jump and a big, impact so you are at maybe performing at 50 percent or 60 percent you want to get to at least 80 percent or 90 percent and then you can have the increment smaller incremental changes so if you if you are performing very low and you want a big jump Pareto analysis is the one where you need to focus on so in the 20 percent of the time and the effort you can get 80 percent of the results achieved on it so the way you do it is this is the graphical representation of how a Pareto chart would look like at one axis, you have got the different types of causes. On one on the uh, x axis, you have got, uh, oh, sorry, on the y axis, you've got the frequency of those causes. And on the z axis, you have the cumulative frequency. So you, so technically, you see where is it that you meet the eighty percent. So here is the eighty percent. If you cross this over, so it's the cause number A and B. If you resolve just these two causes. 80% of your problems will go away. Now, if you want to have the further time available, if you have further resources available, if you need that further excellence or it's further improvement, then you can start doing C, D, E, and F, and then the incremental percentage. And you will see that the amount of effort and time would be required to solve G, the incremental result might be very, very small. So that would be your least priority item. 
So the steps to create a Pareto chart is you identify and list the problems, and then you identify the root causes of each of the problems. Then you ident and you, then again you get the data and you measure the quantum of those causes or the frequency and the, and you give them a score. How many times or how frequently? What is the magnitude? What is the data of each of these causes? Then you group your problems together by root cause. Sometimes some root causes are similar or they are caused by another root cause which is quite similar. So you can group them together. You can add up the scores according to the each group category and then you can identify. Which are the ones which can help me identify address eighty percent of the issues? I can resolve eighty percent quickly. Which are the top one, two, or three items I can focus on? So usually, top three. Do not try to go more than three. And those, if you've done this analysis properly, the top three will give you the eighty percent results, or at least close to the eighty percent results. So, for example. I'll give you a case example of this. So, Ahmed has taken over a facility, failing customer service center with a lot of problems that need resolving. His objective is to increase overall customer satisfaction. He decides to score each problem by the number of complaints that the center has received for each one. So, if this is the data that you have received. So, for example, your problem number one is the phones are not answered quickly enough. So, this is like maybe a high IT help desk service, or maybe a customer call center where you find that when the customers are complaining, that when they are calling, the phones are not even answered. So, cause of that problem could be they've got too few service center staff. So, maybe they have got too uh, too too less number of people in uh, the IT help desk service center or the customer call center. And the number of times this complaints has come is fifteen number of times. The second problem was that the staff seemed distracted and under pressure. Again, one of the causes of this is because you have too little, uh, you don't have enough number of uh, people for service center staff. So again, two different problems. The cause is the same, and the number of times this has happened is that the staff seemed distracted and under pressure. Is six number of times this was complained by the customer. Engineers don't appear to be well organized. They need second visits to bring extra parts. So, so maybe this is a service center uh, for maintenance of, uh, let's say, kitchen equipment or ACs. So, the engineers don't. Uh, they go for the visit. They realize they didn't bring the right parts. They have to come back again. They have to, so poor organization and preparation. So, how many number of times this has happened? Is number four? Is four times. Issue number problem number four. Engineers don't know what time they will arrive. This means that customers may have to be in all day for an engineer to visit, and it's unpredictable. So the whole entire day is spent on wasting. So again, the cause is poor organization and preparation. If the engineers were properly organized and prepared, they could communicate the estimated time of arrival to the customer in advance. How many times this has happened is twice. So again, uh, go back to problem number five. Service center staff don't always seem to know what they are doing. Lack of training is the cause. How many times this has happened? Thirty times. When engineers visit, the customer finds that the problem could have been solved over the phone by the service center staff. It was such an easy fix; they did not have to wait for the engineers to schedule a visit, come all the way, inspect, and this could have been resolved over the phone by a simple few clicks and few few steps, few checks. Again, why this is happening? Because of lack of training of the service center staff. How many number of times this has happened? Twenty-one times. So if you group these together, so basically what is happening is you've got six problems that happened, but really you've got only three causes. You've got lack of training, you've got poor organization and preparation, and you've got too few. You've got you need more people in the service center staff. So these are the three people, three actual causes. Now. If you did not follow a database approach, and if you did not have this third column, and if you only had these two columns, now my guess and my experience is that if you stopped at these only first two columns, guess where most of the people, and in your experience, most of the employees working in the process will identify as the biggest cause, and this is what they need. Would they say we need more training? 
would they say we are poorly organized and we need more preparation or would they say we need more service center staff so use your chat bar to give your responses uh, we've got about 28 people uh, 29 people linked in right now so give your suggestion as to if you did not have the third column what would be your guess in your experience what would be the most popular choice amongst the employees as the biggest cause of the problem poor organization who else anybody else so if you go to the people too few service center staff anyone else so if you go to the people or we've got one vote each right now we've got atiba saying poor organization we've got sai who's saying too few service center we've got manish who's saying lack of training we need more votes here if you go to the employees and ask them the what is the biggest cause of your problems if you go to the service center staff would they say our problem is because we are not well trained or we are very poorly organized or we will, they will say that we don't have enough service center staff okay <laughs> So we have Iman saying they will mention all causes. She must be a consultant. Go with all, right? Okay. Anyway, my experience is that majority of the employees, they always complain about having not enough people in the department. And this is where if you don't use data-based approach, you will go immediately and hire more service center staff. And guess what? You will be incurring more cost and you will not be resolving the problem. So that is why you add the third column and that is why Six Sigma is focused on data-based decisions because if you converted this into a Pareto chart and if you see how this was working, you will find lack of training is the biggest contributing factor which will solve 65% of your issues. So if you wanted the biggest improvement in your customer service to your customers in the, in the service of your staff, just give them proper training. So if this was, this was a one item that you could pick out of the three, just you can just, you only have the time and resources to do only one of the three, either you can make them well organized or you can hire more people or you can give them proper training or spend some time and money on training. Six Sigma will teach you that go for training that will give you 65% of your problems will go away. If you still have more time and resources available, then hire more staff and that would cover 92% of your problems. If you want to go even more in the future years, if you have more time and resources available, if you want to achieve better uh, percentage, if you have the benefits of it, if you seeing for the, from 92 to 100% will give you a better customer service, better revenue, better, better business case in terms of benefits, they outweigh the benefits, outweigh the cost of the implementation go ahead and improve the organization preparation of the engineers as well. So this is how the Pareto chart can help you prioritizing your times and resources and making sure that you spend your time and resources in the right place. We can give you maximum impact of your efforts. Any questions on Pareto chart? That's right, Heather's training would resolve 65%. Yes, uh, Atiba, you have a question. You can unmute yourself and ask. Uh, may I know uh, about the third column, how to um, how to identify those numbers in the third column that we traced? Good question. So uh, remember, uh, we, are, we, are, we have crossed the defined phase. We have, we have crossed the measure phase. Now we are trying to analyze the, pro the root causes of the problem. So he knows that the problem is that the customers are complaining about the service center. So you start obtaining data that when the customer complains, what do the customer complains about? So he got this much information that the customers are complaining about these six things, that the phones are not answered, the staff is distracted, the engineers don't appear to be well organized. You don't just stop there. You ask for data. You take out the data from the system 
that okay how many times customers have complained about this so you identify that the customers have complained about this 15 times that the phones were not answered properly so you get that data you obtain that information now if it's available through a system well and good otherwise you will need to obtain that manually so whenever the, there's a so this this process is about improving or reducing customer complaints that means that they have got a customer complaint form or a database available where the customer is registering their complaint. So they can see that 15 times customers complain about the lack of people answering phones on time. There are 21 times customer has complained that the engineers, when they visit, the customer finds that the solution would have been easy. They should not have to wait for a couple of days. They could have just been told this uh, uh, over the phone and it could have been resolved instantly. So this data you obtain from your customer complaints register or database or whatever system you use, because the problem over here is about reducing customer complaints, improving customer customer service quality. So you obtain this data. So by having this Six Sigma methodology, by having this uh, process followed, basically what Six Sigma is telling you is that you don't just stop in, in the text information, Every single time they tell you something, you obtain information. So, for example, a lot of times people uh, tell us that, you know, we spent a lot of time in handling emergency cases and ad hoc work that comes to us, ad hoc requests from the management. And we, has, we spent so much time doing this. A lot of our time is spent on that. So people use these kind of words a lot, many, almost all of the time. And I always stop myself because of my Six Sigma training and say, okay, how much can you quantify this? How much time are you spending? How can you tell me how many emergency cases or ad hoc requests came this month? And you know what? Invariably, what you will find is that the number of ad hoc requests that came in a month, maybe five or maybe 10. And the number of, and the amount of time they're spending on those ad hoc requests, maybe half an hour a day, maybe one, five hours a week, maybe something like that. So because it is ad hoc and because we are humans, we tend to focus a lot on something that is outside the norm. And we tend to think that this is a lot. But when we actually look at the data and try to authenticate it, we find it, it is not that much. It is, it may be, maybe it happened in a month, one month, many months ago. It is not something that is repeatedly happening. And that employee is always having that memory of that one month when it happened. And he had to work a lot of time, a lot of extra overtime. So maybe that impact is telling him and he is clouding his judgment and he's always remembering that aspect. So that's why data tries to eliminate that level of emotion and judgment from it and gives you a clearer picture where you can make an informed decision. I hope that answers your question. Any other questions on Pareto analysis? All right. So the next tool that we have is about fishbone analysis. This is also called a cause and effect diagram. The reason why it is called a fishbone is when I will show you the picture, it looks like the bone of a fish. So you can understand. It is a structured brainstorming tool to identify potential causes. So for example, in the previous case, in the Pareto analysis, what we saw was that the root cause identification was easier. Ahmed was able to find the root cause of the, the reason why phones are not answered quickly. And the reason why staff is distracted is because there are less number of people. And the reason why the staff center, service center staff doesn't always seem to know what they're doing is because of lack of training. So here, maybe the cause was a little bit more obvious or easy to find or it's known already a lot of times what happens is that people only look at this first step which is actually not the cause it's the first cause or is the real it's actually the it's the further peeling onion peeling of the problem and they think this is the cause and they start resolving this issue and they end up getting exhausted because they are now trying to address six issues without having a visibility of which ones are more important and which ones is connected to each other. So you actually find out there are actually not six issues. There are actually only three causes. So only three needs, three things need to be fixed, not six. So 
this is why a lot of times causes are not very clear to people and this is where the fishbone diagram comes into place where it helps you identify the real root causes not only that it kind of helps you provide a structured way to make sure that you have identified all possible root causes and have not missed out something important that may be the major contributing factor so a lot of times people may end up forgetting or missing out on the real root cause which was the biggest contributor the 65% of the of the time because a lot of times don't people don't identify training as one of the root causes they are always complaining about having less number of people in the in the function and they are always complaining about lack of coordination lack of communication from the management and other team members but a lot of times people forget about the training aspect about the education aspect of it so and that if they had missed that that would have been contributing 65% of the problems so therefore this fishbone analysis kinds of helps you organize your thoughts in a way where you make sure that you don't miss out in any possible category of the root causes so what this does is it categorizes the different types of root causes into six categories which are the six m's because all of them start with m so this is why how why it looks like a fish bone this is like the head of the fish and these are the different bones of the fish and the fins and the six m's are management so the management of the process or the management of the in formation may be the cause of the problem so is that the cause then you can under management you can identify these are the possible causes which have addressed so at the head you actually write the problem statement you actually write the effect or the problem over here in the head and say okay what is the cause of this problem in the management is there a management of information issue is it the management of process issue what is the issue what is the causes then think about the man which is the people itself is it the lack of training of the people is it the lack of skill of the people is it the wrong person doing this job the person is not suitable for this job is it not person qualified for the job not trained for this job what is the cause of this job is it the people issue so people issues will come over here then the method this is where the sop comes in is it the policy and the procedure is the way you are doing it is that the issue sometimes lack of sop and lack of clarity of the procedure is the issue as well so that also comes over here that the method that we are doing it is not clear there is no sop there is no clear protocol on defined to, for the way we are we have to follow the process of fundraising if that is the case that would come as as one of the causes over here now again it is not necessary that the lack of documentation of the defined process is the major contributor may not be always the case maybe sometimes is the case but we don't want to miss out on it and capture the information and data so especially if you want to go towards the excellence aspect from 90% to 99.9997 you want to address all the possible causes so you don't want to miss out on any of the cause then you have got the material cause is it the raw material is it the input that you are receiving the quality of information the the wrong data that you are seeing receiving is that the cause is it the quality of the raw material in the manufacturing process is it the material that you are using to to do, make your stuff is faulty a poor quality that is causing the problem so you look at all the material related issues over here is it the machine issue is it the quality of your equipment is it the quality of your a uh, system that you are using also you can have the erp system over here the technology system that you are using is it the software issue so all of that will the software the uh, the technology the physical equipment and machinery and equipment the location all of this will come in machine over here so you can identify all of the causes related to that aspect over here then the last aspect is the measurement are you capturing the data incorrectly for example one of the very good questions uh, you uh, one of the participants i think it was atiba earlier asked what what is the performance metric what is the metric i am going to use to measure the performance so that's very that is one of the reasons why it needs to be defined in the project charter because a lot of times you end up finding that you've got the measure phase you've got the, to the analysis phase and you are measuring the data in the analysis phase and you're using the wrong metric so your measurement method is incorrect so you need to make sure that you need to understand is there a measurement issue over here are we using the wrong measurement tool are we using the are we using the wrong measurement method 
so it can be interconnected as well maybe you're using you're getting the wrong measurement because you have got the wrong equipment or you've got the wrong method of using it so again a lot of these six uh, causes are interconnected as well uh, can we have mr mr mohammed ramzan uh, mute his uh, mic please yes thank you uh, so one of the uh, uh, another possibility why they are all pointing to the arrow towards the center is this is the backbone so it is also possible that there is a linkage between the causes of one of these categories as well so for example like you were mentioning in the measurement one of the causes would be that you've got the wrong measurement data and one of the further reasons for that wrong measurement data is you've got the wrong equipment measuring it you've got faulty equipment or you've got the faulty process you don't have the right process that you are using the right sop that you are using to measure to get the data so that's why the arrow is pointing towards the center which is they are these causes are connected to this uh, category which is measurement and all of these can be interconnected and they are all contributing towards that problem statement or the effect so this is the cause and effect relationship now another reason why we want to do this is that a lot of times we end up and this is why one of the reasons why we want to go and ask this question of the five why is that we seem to spend a lot of time in immediately each identifying the problem the first level of cause and fixing those problems but those don't prevent the problems they don't they don't fix it over over time in a sustainable way we don't spend enough time to further onion peel understand the root cause because when we fix the root cause we actually prevent the problems from happening so for example if we address the training aspect we actually start preventing the double visits or the unnecessary visits of the engineers so this becomes a much more sustainable way to prevent inefficiencies to prevent problems and improve your customer satisfaction as well any other questions on fishbone analysis and how to conduct a fishbone Yes, uh, Sai, you've got a question. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, uh, does it sometimes happens that a manager or a champion of a project might be in a position to sway over their decisions or, let's say, to decide the points for measuring the problem? Wonderful question. So this is, a, uh, again, uh, if, if you are experiencing this kind of a uh, issue or a challenge, this is why six sigma methodology may be a very suitable methodology for your project management because six sigma methodology forces decisions making based upon hardcore authenticated data and it asks you to measure data at every stage of the phase so you are deciding on the metrics you are measuring the quantum of the problem at the defined stage eventually so initially when you had the defined stage and the project charter you define the size of the problem how big the problem is and how i'm measuring the problem and how i'm measuring the benefits of resolving this problem as well so if at each stage you have a documented project charter and you've got all of these data available there and at the measure stage also you've got the same metrics and you've got the data available over there as well in the analysis phase also you've got the data available for everything then it becomes very difficult for people to influence their judgment into decision making i am not saying it can be 100% eliminated judgment can never be eliminated as long as people are involved maybe when you have robots and everything is artificial intelligence you can have eliminate judgments but judgments can never be eliminated 100% they can be minimized and they can be managed properly so when you are following a data based approach or data driven decision making then that decision making will become much more objective rather than subjective so this is where if you are experiencing this this to be a very serious issue in your project management that few people because of their maybe position or because maybe of their uh, sensitivities they tend to influence on the decision making which may or may not be the right decision then data driven approach six sigma methodology approach might be the better uh, better way to try to manage that aspect because 
one of the two things will happen. Either if they are right, the data will support that. So they will have a strong basis for their own argument and their judgment as well. Or the data will go completely against that. And that would be a strong justification to change their mind or to convince them the data is not supporting where they're doing, where they're going. So again, having that data and information and presenting that data in these forms in using these tools helps identify and address that judgment issue to either confirm that the judgment is right or to confirm that the judgment is wrong. Either way, it's a win-win situation because you'll get the right answer through that. I hope that answers your questions. If there are any other questions, we can take that as well on uh, page board analysis. Yes, Atiba. Uh, so if we have a, a similar cost for all the, for maybe two, three components uh, on the M, you know, the M thing, so uh, should we place all those causes in all those components or can we just put it in one? Can you give me an example? For example, if we have a delay in the procurement of, or maybe a delay in the uh, raw material procurement. So it will be, uh, it will be included in the material section also, the method section also. So, or, or it will be a part of any one of them. Perfect example. That's why I asked for this example. Because anytime you find yourself in a situation where the, so we're talking about, let, let's first clear that we're not talking about things that are interconnected. We're talking about the same thing appearing in different categories. For example, delay in procuring of material. Is that a, is it a method issue as well? Is it a man issue as well? And is it a material issue as well, right? So same thing appearing in the three things. Anytime you find yourself in a situation where you think that the same thing applies to multiple categories, the quickest or the most likely reason is you've got the wrong item. It is not the real root cause. So that means you need to ask another why question. Why is there a delay in procurement of materials? Is it because the material is not available in the market? Is it because the specs of the material that you required are in or you sent out in the order are incorrect or are, are not uh, matching with the available uh, specs in the market is it delay because the person who's in the procurement department is not following up with the supplier promptly and is is the person who's causing the problem is it delay because the procurement process is not being followed properly or there is no documented process or there is a process breakdown so Anytime you find yourself that you have the same cause, which seems likely in multiple categories, most likely you've got the wrong cause. You don't have the cause yet. You still need to dig deeper and ask the question, why? Because the more you ask yourself the why question, the more towards the bottom root cause you will get, and those will fit in only one category. So you mean to say that from out of any one cause, if there are multiple other reasons for that one cause, then you take out another uh, fish bone from that cause also. So no, no, not at all, out. not at all. So if if your root cause was delay in procurement of material, I will not even do a fish bone. You can do a mental fish bone, but you ask yourself the question, why? Why is there a delay? Is it a delay because of the process? Is it delay because of the people? Why? So you ask the question why and the answer you get, then you say, okay, is it fitting in one category or is it also looking like multiple categories? If it is multiple categories, then you ask another why question. Because fishbone analysis is trying to get to the bottom cause of it. Because if you fix that root cause, root bottom cause, then you will actually fix the problem properly and you will actually make it preventable, preventable solution as well. You will prevent the problem. If you only address the delay in procurement of material, maybe you will address one aspect of it and you will not be able to cover all of it. You will not be able to prevent the problem and the problem will come back again. So yes, I understand what you're saying. It's a mini fishbone analysis, but you don't have to do it formally all over again, make a whole fishbone analysis out of the same problem statement. You can just ask yourself the five questions, ask yourself the five why questions 
basically what that says is ask yourself why 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 at least five times to see if you if you've got to the root cause as soon as you've got to the root cause you can place the root cause in the right category over here got it thank you thank you any other questions are there any questions on the chat that we have missed out there is a question on cypoc cypoc brings ctqs to us what do we get through vsm ah okay the cypoc brings the ctqs to us yes in terms of it can give you the complete visibility of your suppliers all the way to customers and what is critical to quality for the customers what vsm does is it takes the process element out of the cypoc which is the p and it identifies which steps of those process are value adding and which one are non value adding which you can eliminate which you can as an opportunity to eliminate them so it actually streamlines your process aspects or it fixes your process issues because a lot of times what happens is the critical to quality is being missed because of the problems in the process any other questions here ah aziz had asked a question can six sigma can be applied to a new company or it is only based on historical data and mohammed had already replied to it that you can use define measure uh, analyze and then you can see you design and validate if you are actually uh, creating a new product or designing a new product or creating a new company you can use that method as well so very clear uh, very rightly answered all right okay looks like you have covered the questions in the chat as well uh let's move on to i think the last uh, phase which is the waste walk now another uh, advantage of six sigma is that we want to eliminate wastages in inefficient or uh, non value adding items uh so we call what we call a waste walk that you walk through a process and you identify different types of waste so what i wanted to do was give you some kind of ideas on what are the different types of waste or different types of inefficiencies that you can look out for and if you see that happening in any process that's a quick identification that this is definitely something that you can improve on and get a quick result now the scope of the uh, specific uh, uh, the, uh, the waste walk is the specific area and again part of the process so again you're focusing on the p of the cypoc which is and again like you mentioned in the very early analysis of the introduction of the six sigma it is about the process area of the business so again you're looking at the business process and you do an observation or a walk through of the process so you can walk through the process by going through the process steps by the person who's doing it with them or you can sit and took a take a video or observe the process if it's happening in the same floor with in a machine room area or if it's going from one department to another department and for another department you can follow that process with them as well so whichever methodology whichever different type of the process it is you can use that methodology and use that observation or a walking walk through method to go through how they're following the process so you view the selected, selected business process or the work center you observe the business process you identify the wasteful activities and you describe you find you just note them down uh so you don't have to draw the flow chart you is there's no uh, spaghetti diagram it's a very quick way to identify the uh, elimination of the waste especially especially for companies who are performing at below 95% level you will be able to find these very quickly and it will be very evident obvious once i tell you the what to look for so these are different types of waste complexity so remember when we looked at the cypoc uh, the uh, spaghetti diagram we saw multiple different kinds of lines intersecting that's telling you there's there's too much complexity over here so complexity itself sometimes becomes a waste because a lot of times because of the old sops because of the different people we unnecessarily make a process very complex 
and complicated. It doesn't need to be. It can be very simple and straightforward. If you see a lot of labor involved, that's the potential opportunity for now with the technology available, a lot of automation can be done. A lot of things can be done computerized, uh, automated, so that can be reduced. That's it. So if there's a high labor intensive, that's usually an area for opportunity for automation and efficiency there. If you see overproduction, so for example, if you consistently see that you are able to produce more quantity than being sold and you're always increase, having a high level of stocks available, that means that you're having a faster overproduction capacity. So that's overproduction. Faster production than necessary for your customers on the sales side. That's again a waste because you, then you can, don't need, you can reduce some of the cost to make your process a little bit slower in terms of production side of it. You can save some money over there. Facility space. A lot of times you see that the space is not properly organized or uh, 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 there's another tool of uh, Six Sigma that you can use, which is called 5S, which can uh, further organize and streamline the space and you can better utilize the space. So a lot of times, a lot of space is wasted in uh, terms of your uh, machine space, warehouse space, workspace, office space. So rents are very expensive as well. So a lot of times office space is also wasted. Energy resources in terms of your utilities, water, electricity, uh, any other energy that you're using, uh, that you can use, see that, if it, that is being wasted. A lot of times, all of these, a lot of these energies can be recycled and reused. Uh, process defects. So if you see a lot of times that uh, the products are being rejected by either your QA or complaints coming from the uh, from the customer, that means that there's a there's a product quality issue. That there's a defects. So if there are a lot of defects, that means that there's a lot of wastage or a lot of errors that are happening. And any any of this and a value chain of your SIPOC analysis, either from the supplier or the inputs or the process or the outputs. Uh, a lot of, uh, if there are defects, then there's some mistake happening in, e in either part of the chain. Materials, uh, again, if you have a lot of materials sitting in a high stock quantity in the warehouse, uh, that means that, uh, or you have idle materials uh, sitting, that means that there is a wastage over here. You have, you have created more material than necessary or at the wrong time. If there is a wastage of time, if, there's a, if you see somebody waiting for somebody, uh, if a process is on hold because it's, it's waiting for a process. So there's a backlog somewhere and the rest of the people are sitting idle and they don't have the backlog. So because of somebody else's backlog, other people don't have, don't have work to do. Transportation. Uh, transportation is costly. Transportation is time consuming. Transportation is not just for goods and logistics. Transportation also in terms of taking documents from one place to another. Can you automate that? Can you reduce the time? Can you bring those people sit, sit closer to each other? Uh, any safety hazards that you see, because a safety hazard will cause the process to stop or to process to break or to, or to process to halt. Uh, so that is a wastage of time and resources as well. So any potential safety hazards that you can eliminate proactively will help you keep your process going on a regular basis and make it more efficient. So there's a, a uh, acronym that you can use as Tim Wood. Tim Wood can help you identify different types of waste that you can see. So whenever you are uh, observing any process, if you're in any project, even if it's a fundraising process, in the procurement process, any uh, IT service, the help desk process, any process, and if you want to identify what are the different types of potential waste that we can eliminate, think of Tim Wood, T for transportation. If, you, if there's a transportation time involved, so you can look for T, for time, transportation and time. Inventory, if there is a high buildup of inventory in stocks and warehouse capacity, then that means that there's there is some inefficiency and wastage over there. If there's a lot of motion involved going from one place to another, if, they, if the, if the uh, technician has to go farther away to pick up the tools and then the machine is somewhere else and he has to walk a lot, that motion causes, and then if he has to move hands uh, from one place to another place, that's causing motion and time. That's a, called a time and motion study. That's what uh, Toyota had pioneered in their assembly line. So um, they did a time and motion study. So from that, they eliminated the need for motion. They minimized the motion required because motion means time. Time means in terms of a high volume of activity. Time means a lot of wastage of uh, uh, time and then a lot of cost involved in that. So it, in that, if you save that time, 
in the same time they were able to produce more cars so that became much more profitable for them uh, we, uh, so with w is waiting so if you see any backlog or any waiting that means that that backlog process area that needs to be fixed so that it becomes smooth and you have the same everybody is busy at the same time everybody is utilized uh, constantly not somebody is under under utilized and uh, somebody is over over capacity uh, over utilized and then uh, having a backlog over production if you've got if you if you consistently produce more than you are selling you, your inventory levels are constantly rising that means that you've got over production issue that you can fix you need to fix that issue and a lot of times it's not it's also because of the lack of communication lack of planning and organization so again you can address the root causes and through that root causes you can address the over production and and save money and cost over there Uh, there is over processing again if somebody is processing more than what is required uh, sometimes in the service scenario you can see over reviewing over approval or too many approvals too many reviews needed that's also over processing so anytime there is another person repeating a similar process that's a non value adding process non business value adding process it can be eliminated that's over processing and then you can look at defects that there are errors are happening if there are mistakes happening if there's a correction of error happening that means somebody made an error and a lot of times what people end up doing is that instead of correcting the error or correcting the root cause which caused the error addressing that they put they add a person to check for the error and correct it and get it and review it so that is how a lot of times in the companies in the sops you will find a lot of reviewers and approvers get added because there was an error historically many many years ago so instead of addressing the root cause of the error and fixing what caused the error so that the error can be prevented in the future they keep on adding people to review and check for those errors so timboard is something that you can use so this is a graphical representation that if you find that this this lady is busy she's got a lot of work over here and this person has nothing over here that means he's waiting he's wasting time that means there's a there's a pro process issue that that this can be a streamlined so for example in a clinic uh, you will find uh, the the six sigma study was used to then segregate the different kinds of counters so you will have the people who come in with insurance on one counter the people who are coming without insurance on another, another counter who and then who are paying back uh, by insurance card or who are paying by cash on separate counters for each of these types so you can uh, distribute this workload so that this person doesn't fit or sit idle so those people then quickly process and then this 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 workload will go will go down and then he will have, he, he will have similar level of work so this is the waiting wastage correction so again this person has processed this comes over here and now he is doing it all over again he is correcting and checking everything so again over processing unnecessary non value adding convenience so this this uh, forklifter is carrying all of this and he has to go all this path and deliver over, over everything to, to, to this machine so can this machine be brought close over here or can there be an entrance over here so forklifter can from, come from here so again you can uh, identify these and eliminate the wastage of time and the uh, the distance it takes to, to deliver the machine the goods motion again uh, this is the uh, uh, toyota study that i was referring to that how much time how much movement is required to fetch the tool and then where the tool is needed to work on so if there's a lot of distance available between where the grabbing the tools from and then where it's used used and that's why one of the solutions you will see is people a lot of technicians wear belts with the tools tying with their belt so it's very easy access that's motion study so they reduce the motion required to fetch the tool and then where it is used uh, and required over production you've got lots of production over here and again this machine is produced and then another machine is uh, not being able to process so for example if this machine is able to process 50 units and the next step of the process the machine can only be uh, only process 30 units then there is an over production issue and you, this machine will be sitting idle then so you need to have two of these machines to be able to process 60 so that it's a continuous flow of the process then you can do a cost benefit analysis what is the cost of waiting and having this machine idle and that time spent versus the cost of buying that additional machine 
as a second step of the process. Again, over processing, you have got more uh, items to do. Again, many people doing it over again, or too much stuff being processed, and then you don't you don't have uh, the second step of the process to uh, catch up that uh, workload. Factory inventory. So if the inventory again, if the inventory is rising constantly, and you're not not able to sell at the required level, or not uh, if the raw material is increasing and the production facility is not able to use that raw material at the same level, then you've got the uh, the over production issue, and you've got the uh, uh, inventory issue as well. Underutilized. So this person is sleeping because he is waiting for this machine or this person to do the work over here, and he has to wait. Again, similar to waiting and underutilized skills. Again, remember steps are wasteful. They can be automated. People are valuable. So the, every time you're able to save time or motion or distance for the movement of people, that's a lot of value you will get into the business because that time of that people is very expensive. Okay. Any questions on uh, waste walk? Remember Tim Wood as the acronym. Uh, hello, sir. I'm Shemin. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, whenever uh, we try to identify the waste processes, like uh, it's always like you heard, you have said, with the technology we can improve uh, processes by automate them. Okay, but uh, whenever I have faced that whenever we um, suggest that through automation, we can improve the processes and eliminate the workload and few people can do the uh, large people work. So people are resistance because they know that large number of people have uh, redundant skills and, and they will lose their job on workplace. And uh, this can be like, we, we can take the example in public sector, people are avoiding to get privatized because they know when the technology came and their uh, processes improve. So there's a uh, huge chances uh, for them to lose their job. So uh, like things are complex on real pheno phenomena when we are on real uh, situations. So we cannot, uh, I believe that we cannot, uh, uh, move uh, straightforwardly and without any hazard or uh, resistance from the people when we are identifying the ways and trying to eliminate them absolutely correct and but uh, but you you mentioned the key word over here so the in the government sector people are afraid to do this uh, in the private system because they know that in a private company where the focus is on efficiency and cost effectiveness and competition and profitability there the private owners or the business owners or the owner of the business is not going to have any wastages allowed. So that is where the Six Sigma methodology will be coming handy because if you can eliminate those wastes, then you can avoid that situation. Now, another aspect of it is that even in the government situation, the reason why they have come up to this position where they have got excess number of people who are doing things in an old fashioned way, which the technology has come in and changed quite a lot is because there was no continuous improvement methodology like Six Sigma instituted in government authorities. So if the government authorities, so for example, if you take the example of Dubai government authorities like RTA, Dubai police, Adiba, in the government authorities over there, they have got a continuous improvement methodology instilled in, in the government sector itself. So you continuously hear about the changes in the procedure, more automation, more paperless work. Every couple of weeks, I get an email from Diva that they've closed down one of their customer happiness center because everything has been now automated. You can do all of those activities via the website or the smart, smartphone app. So even in the government sector, if you have a methodology which is on continuous improvement, that will help you prevent getting into a situation where there have been more people than necessary and now those people are trying to save their job by being more inefficient so this is one of the reasons why in our region in south asia in the government sector people resist privatization so much because government sectors traditionally had never incorporated any continuous improvement methodology 
And in the private sector, they have moved on several decades of continuous and process improvement. And as a result of that, they have the organizations have become much leaner. They've got more and more technology usage and automated. They've become much more competitive. They've become much more cost effective and they have become much more profitable as well. Similarly, a lot of times what you will find is uh, our institutions like uh, airlines industries, uh, steel manufacturing, they have become non uh, textile industry, uh, sports goods industry. They become non-competitive in the export market because in the export you are market, you are competing against the global players and the global players have adopted uh, methodologies like Six Sigma uh, to continuously improve, eliminate waste, eliminate uh, inefficiencies and reduce their costs, improve their profitability. So they have become much more competitive. Their pricing is much better. So in terms of the quality of the product, in terms of the faster delivery of the product, and in terms of the cost of the product, those players who have continuous improvement methodology, they can deliver that product or service to the customer in a much better, faster, and cost-effective way at a better price. So you start to lose out. So this is what happens that, that these current situations are a live example of what happened historically. But again, you have to start from somewhere. It is much better to start now so that in the next 10 years, you can improve the situation. So again, uh, two things. One, this is the, the not having a continuous improvement, improvement methodology is a root cause of this problem. Second is that you have to start from somewhere. So not doing it even now will again be a much more bigger problem 10 years from now. So you have to start from somewhere. Any other questions on uh, the waste work? We can quickly do the last uh, tool and then open up for general questions. Uh, Pokayuki was developed in uh, Japan in Toyota. And this was a tool to try to eliminate uh, defects at all or mistake proofing. At, uh, like we used to say, foolproof the process or foolproof the system that a normal person would just not be allowed to make a mistake or he would not be able to make a mistake. That it would automatically ensure that the thing is done correctly. Uh, there's a joke behind this that uh, Japanese started this uh, pokayoki and mistake proofing and foolproofing their processes and their systems and especially for in terms of their eliminating defects in their products much earlier on. And the Americans adopted this much later. So there was an American company that adopted Six Sigma methodology and they eventually reached Six Sigma level after a lot of effort and investment. And they wanted to boast and they wanted to show off this skill. So they placed an order for, let's say packaging, uh, packing, uh, let's say take an example of bottles, so packing packaging materials, let's say plastic bottles. So they placed an order to a pack bottle manufacturer in Japan. And they said, we would like to order 1 million bottles and only three of them can be defect. Three can be defective. So the Japanese company accepted the order. And when the timeline came in on time, the order was delivered, but one million and three bottles. And there was a note attached by the Japanese company that here is the order for one million. Since we work on a zero defect facility, we had to specially produce three defective products just to meet your requirement of three defective products. So this is where the mistake proofing is coming from. Uh, this is to allow for zero defects. This is even going beyond Six Sigma. So especially for repetitive tasks or actions that depend on a, uh, on a, a memory or depend upon a certain way of doing things, they were saying that if it is people dependent, it is prone to errors and mistakes. So let's try to make it in such a way that people cannot just forget it or it just doesn't allow them to make an error. So if, even if they lose the focus, even if they forget about it, they just don't end up making a mistake. The rationale behind that is that they have followed a, a rule called 1 to 10 to 100. So every single time a mistake is made and is corrected at the next level, it costs the company and the business 10 times the previous cost. So for example, if the order is entered correctly, the cost to that company would be $1. But if it is entered incorrectly and then it is corrected at the billing stage, the cost to the company would be $10 because now you've got another person who's checking it, who's rejecting it, 
bringing it back to the person who's ordering it. He is correcting it, and then again, it's going through the same review and checking mechanism. So that's why the cost increases by ten percent, ten times. If the error is detected by the customer, the cost to the company would be a hundred dollars, ten times more, because that customer was unhappy. Customer had a bad experience, and then if that customer went ahead and shared the experience with his friends and family. now the cost to the company is 1000 dollars 10 times more because those people will no longer buy uh, become your customer as well so that is why every single step of the of the process it goes where this error is not detected and corrected it costs the company 10 times the cost of the previous process that is why they wanted to remain at the dollar 1 level rather than reach to a dollar 10 or dollar 100 or even 1000 so they wanted to mistake proof they used the poka yoki uh, formula And eliminate and make sure that it is done correctly over here. The first step. So do it right the first time. So again, so they thought about again. This is more towards uh, characteristics of uh, manufacturing, but similar concept can be used in service, and I'll explain in a little bit how. So they think about how to verify the items by their nature or the characters, either by weight, dimension, or shape. If you remember. uh in when you we were when we were small kids we used to have those little boxes where you will have puzzle pieces shaped in circle square triangle and star and you will have a box with those uh, holes in various different directions on one side and you can only put the square through a square hole that's how you learn the shapes and you learn to put it recognize the shape and put it there that's one of the item, one of the ways to do it you can only put the right pl plug into the right place so you can use it in manufacturing division as well you can use it in ele electricity as well you see it that you've got a three pin flat plug in the uae that you use it has got a flat top and then a, hor a horizontal flat at the bottom you can only put that plug into the correct socket it would not fit into the wrong socket it would not use the wrong uh, without the earth mechanism so so the uae plug will not fit in the uk plug or would not fit in the uk us plug with uh, without the adapter so that's how you will mistake proof you will not make sure that the character the shape of it would only allow fitting it in the right place you you can think about the process sequence as well you cannot perform the next step if the prior step is not done correctly so for example you have electronic forms you have required fields if the required field is not filled in it would not let you submit the form it will give you keep giving you error it will highlight that in red so that is mistake proofing that it is not that you miss that field goes to the next step the next person reviews it and rejects it and sends it back to you that you missing a field please fill it again so that eliminates that process by having a check in the system that if the field is not filled the the form does not get submitted a lot of time in your immigration your visa renewal process they've already put that system in place so if you don't upload the right document the form doesn't get submitted so that's mistake proofing a detect deviations from fixed values so for example in your counters in your scales your odd part out you can identify what should be the norm what should be the standard that should be coming out of here uh, so the, for example there's another uh, joke behind this is that uh, this the american company was using all of these six sigma methodology and this poka yoki also they come up to it and they said that uh, there were issues with the custom with the with the customer that uh, this they were pr producing uh, uh, bar soaps and there were some cases in the carton where the bar soap was, was empty so if there's a carton of 24 maybe sometimes there were 23 or 22 put in the bar in the carton So the customers were complaining that they, they were paying for twenty four, but there were only twenty two or twenty three coming out of the carton. So they identified the extra weight of what should be the total weight of the twenty four cartons, uh, what should be the weight of the uh, bar soap and the packaging material, and they put in sensors in the machine. So every single time the machine sensed a variation in the, in the weight, it would identify that there is an error in the in this carton, and uh, this carton is not uh, filled properly. so what uh, the uh, company in japan and south asia what they did was they came up with a very easy and cost effective solution they put a fan in front of the bar soap so any time a, a bar soap uh, can came out without the bar it means it was very light and the fan was able to blow it away so that means only the correct bar soap was putting in the carton so they they solved the issue with a very easy way 
So again, you look at the different types of characteristics, the weight, the shape, the dimension. What are the critical key features that you can identify the error with or the correct value with? And you combine that those two together and you come up with a way to uh, mistake proof the system. I'll give you some practical examples from real world. Uh, so for example, if you have the bills of material in your system already approved and prepared, that means only the correct materials will go into the database and for the ordering and into the manufacturing process. If you have checklists, so you can use in the service sector as well, that if you have checklists, that if you are raising a purchase requisition, please make sure you've got these types of specs available, you've got the quantity available, you've got the budget available, all of these checks are done. If this, they are done, then only it can come to our uh, purchase department. Similarly, you can do these checklists for legal department, from finance department, for invoice processing. A lot of these things can be done. A lot of these can be done manually. A lot of these can be, can be automated in the system as well. So checklists are also a way or to mistake proof to make sure that before the document comes to you, the, the missing information is not there. The information is properly filled out and proper attachments are already in place. Alignment pins, like you mentioned about the three pin plugs. Uh, similarly, you have uh, in the previous days, we used to have the USB, uh, the connector. So the USB connector was shaped, uh, there was a longer side on the top and there was a shorter side at the bottom. So it could only go into our phones in a particular direction. It would not allow us to put it into the wrong way. Now with the new USB-C connectors, they have eliminated that error as well. Similarly, if you remember previously in the computers, uh, in the laptops, we used to have the CD drive and the CD drive used to, if you open it, it used to have this hole in the center and the CD uh, actually would have a hole in the center. It will fit in directly. So it means that you can only place it correctly. It, could, it would not be uh, placed loose. Uh, online forms, we already mentioned, so that you can have the mandatory fields. A lot of government organizations, a lot of uh, company forms, a lot of applications now have that available. So you can make sure that the mandatory fields are, are already filled without the form is being submitted. Uh, without uh, those, the forms cannot be submitted. So these are some of the methods that you, uh, are actually results of the Poker UK analysis. All right, any questions on Poker UK? and where we can use it, how we can use it. it. It's not only just in the manufacturing, it can be used in the service functions as well, in terms of checklists, in terms of forms, in terms of automation. Any questions? Okay, we will move on to the last phase. This is now the uh, so the improved phase is the poker yoki in waste walk that will give you ideas on the solutions or where you can eliminate the waste, where you can improve the process, where you can improve the uh, reduce the mistakes. Now the last phase we said the control phase is also very important because we want to make sure that the improvements that we have come out are sustainable into the future as well. They continue. So the control charts give you a way to keep track of the progress. So similarly. When you have identified the metrics in the project charter, you don't just measure it during the project phase and then stop measuring. In the control phase, in the control charts, you continue the measurement of that metrics on a regular basis and make it a regular routine and develop a reporting mechanism around it. That you have to capture the data, you have to report that data and somebody has to review that data on a regular basis and ask questions. So that way, if you track the data on a regular basis, then you can identify proactively in advance when the defect is about to happen. So the control chart is a graph. It's a graphical representation to uh, analyze uh, how the process is being run over time. So if you have got the control chart system developed, then even after the project for the next six months, eight months, a year, two year, three year, continuously the data, data will be getting monitored for the products coming out, for the services being delivered, are they within the quality parameters or not? Any complaints coming in? And, and that, that graphical representation will continue there with the upper spec and the lower spec there. So that is, and, and I'll show you uh, an example, a graphic representation of how it looks like and how you can use it to uh, proactively make an intervention to make sure that before the defect has happened, you're able to fix the problem. 
So uh, design of the control chart is it always has a central line, which is the average, which is the most uh, acceptable data. And then you have the upper line and you have the lower line. It cannot exceed this and it can, cannot come below this. And lines can be determined by historical data. Lines can only also be determined by the requirements from the customer, which is the CTQs, the critical to quality. So this is an example of the control chart. Uh, this could be like a heartbeat monitor as well. And the healthcare industry, you've got the upper limit, you've got the lower limit, and you've got the average. So as long as the data remains close to the average, you are okay. But if it starts going towards like this, then you know it, if you don't intervene at this point correctly, it may, has a chance of breaking the lower limit. Similarly, if it is going like this, then if you don't intervene over here, there is a possibility it will cross this. So this monitoring something like this will give you the ability to analyze two ways. Proactively identify if the trend is going towards up or down and identify the reasons why of the, of the spikes as well. So if there are any big spikes, you can further analyze the root causes of those and further streamline and improve the process to remove the variability as well. Remember, there were three objectives we identified in the beginning for the Six Sigma. One is to eliminate the defects. So eliminate the items which are uh, outside these lines eliminate the uh, centralize the process so most of the items are close to the central line and make sure it it reduces the variability as well so the, the, the spikes are lower as well so that's the third objective it will give you the identification over here so if you are monitoring the data and it comes like this that if you, you've got the lower limit you've got the upper limit you've got the lower uh, the central line and if the data is coming like this, that the no, no points are outside your control limits, then you, you've got a better control over that. So it, the process is under control. Then you've got a data like this, that once it went below the lower limit, and once it went above the upper limit, that means there are two types of variations that happen. Once it caused something caused, and that is something that you can investigate to eliminate further, which it, which it caused to go below the lower limit. And something happened over here, which caused it to go next time uh, higher than the upper limit. So again, you can, you can identify these two root causes over here and make an intervention so that it doesn't happen in the future. Similarly, if you see a downward pattern like this, that means that if you know that if you don't intervene somewhere over here, and if you just continue to ignore, it will eventually go below. Similarly, if you've got the opposite trend going upward, you need to make sure that you intervene in the system earlier on where the trend is happening to make sure before it reach, breaches the limits, you can intervene and correct the system and correct the process. So that is another advantage of having control charts. Not only you will have a sustainable process, anytime this process is going haywire, you can proactively identify and capture and correct it before it goes all the way to the customer. Because remember, the cost to the customer is 10 times before the process cost. So early warning signal is there. It prevents over tweaking of the process as well. You don't have to continuously monitor the process if it's within the, within the control chart. It assures the process is working as designed and as the improved process. So it doesn't go back to the old ways. And it provides information on process capability. So if over a period of time, you can see that, okay, it has it is remained within, the, within certain two limits. So it gives you the process capability that maybe from now on, you can even further squeeze the upper and lower limits to make it even tighter control. So that gives you the process capability that has enough time passed. And now do we have the capability to go further towards the six sigma level? Maybe you have achieved three sigma level. Maybe you have achieved four sigma level. Can you go towards six sigma? So that's our last uh, tool, which is about control charts. Uh, now we can open up. So it's about uh, last 20 minutes left. If you have any questions, you can always uh, send us an email. Uh, you can send us questions uh, on the uh, WhatsApp as well. Uh, you can now, the floor will be open. You can ask general questions about Six Sigma or about the specific last tool that we talked about and about the methodology as well. We already have Atiba raising our hand. You can please go ahead. Uh, I wanted to ask whether there is a range of control limits as mentioned, or is it to a particular to every particular problem and particular to the organizations? Yes, it is going to be particular to the problem and the organization because the range is going to be coming from your customer. So what, when you are looking at a process, 
what is the customer's requirement for that process at what range would they allow you so for example some people call it tolerance limit maybe you are allowed if you've got a target for your fundraising you are allowed plus minus 5% variation so your plus 5% is your upper limit minus 5% is your lower limit and the average is your target so so again it will come it will be unique to each process each organization because it will be coming and determined by your customer okay any other questions i will stop the share so we can have a full screen view and i can see if anybody is raising hands any question the floor is now open to you all of you if you have any questions about six sigma methodology you can write in the chat box as well i will have that open to me as well now uh people are asking for uh, sharing of slides so yes uh, the company will uh, when you registered you uh, uh, with your emails uh yeah, so we have all of your email address we will share the presentation slides with all of you as well on email uh heather shared that the fan thing also happened with base chips to uh, eliminate uh, less filled chips or empty packets that's very good any other questions on six sigma um sorry actually i am searching for raising hand option but i didn't find <laughs> it that way that's all right you can you, now the floor is open you can unmute yourself and ask the question yes go ahead shamin Uh, guide us about the certification award of six sigma how we can okay, do yes. that good question good question there are uh, three levels of uh, six sigma certification you can start with a yellow belt certification then it's a green belt certification and then there is a black belt certification then in within black belt you can have two different types you can have master black belt and you have money belt as well so uh the requirements uh, general requirements for yellow belt certification is just a training course usually usually a two and a half three days training course with a quiz at the end uh that can give you yellow belt certification the proper requirement with a good institute from a green belt certification point of view is that you not only go through some rigorous uh training where you learn some com more complicated statistical tools but you actually have to complete a six sigma project with minimum uh, a savings of 100000 dollars so there has to be a, a dollar value of savings that you achieve through that six sigma project so that the improvement actually happens so you have not only have to complete the training process but you actually have to deliver a project that delivers substantial savings to your company or organization as well and they have to verify and certify that that combined together will give you a green belt project in in the black belt project you have to be uh, do two things you have to do a bigger project with a bigger dollar value attached to the savings and you have to be able to supervise and manage multiple green belt projects as well so those are the levels of certification now having said this these are the proper ways of doing proper certifications Uh, which are value adding which are meaningful in the uh, in the uh, job market as well be mean, meaningful for the uh, for the employer as well now there are a lot of companies available online which are providing these kind of certifications just as a money making business that you can pay them they will give you unlimited uh, attempts at the uh, exam so you can you're sure to pass it eventually doesn't matter how many times you attempt and they will prepare a documentation and uh, for a project uh for you you would not have conducted the project but they will prepare that project done and will give you certificate as well so again there are two ways of doing it one is a proper way which i told you about and the other is which is available online again uh in my experience companies who are genuinely looking for genuine uh, six sigma professionals they're able to differentiate by talking to them by having a discussion with them that who has come through what level of what type of certification so uh, the reason of telling you both ways is to watch out for these kinds of uh, methods available 
if you are interested in a german certification you need to make sure that you go through go through a, a company which is uh, an institute which is recognized and then align your company professional as well if you're going for a green uh, uh, certification that they can certify a project for you i hope that answers your questions on certifications any other questions on Six Sigma or any of the tools that we talked about? We have about last 10, 12 minutes left. Umar, Elias, I see that you're having issues with your audio. So if uh, you have a questions, you can type in the chat box. Thank you, Salman, for your feedback. Thank you, Manish, for your feedback as well. Uh, great to have feedback on the chat session as well that you guys like the session. I hope it was helpful. And uh, again, if you have any questions, you can uh, reach out to us. Uh, we will share the presentation slides with the participant registra registrations. Uh, so you'll have the slide decks available for you. Uh, thank you so much for your participation. Very good to have uh, good participation and good questions. Uh, that makes it much more engaging for me as well. Uh, it was wonderful interacting with all of you. Uh, you have all connected from different places. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And I hope, hope you uh, have a wonderful time. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zed. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you.